Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this Lecture 5 of the Cricket South Africa Level 1 course hosted by Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. My name is Abdullah Steenkamp, and my co-presenter for this evening will be Tom Mokarosi. The usual format of our lecture, I will kick off and we'll be covering laws 23 until 27. I'll then pass the baton to Tom, who will cover laws 28 till 31. And after that, we will open the floor for the Q&A session. Law 23 covers buys and leg buys, and we're going to start with buys and Let's look at what the definition according to, according to the laws of cricket is for buys. So a buy is when a ball delivered by, by the bowler, and there's only one condition for the buy, it needs not to touch the bat or the person. And any runs accrued from that delivery it will be seen as buys. So again, to confirm, ball that's, be, that's being delivered should not touch the bat or person. And if that is the case, any runs accrued from that delivery will be credited as buys to the batting side. So there's only one. It should not touch the bat or the person. That's the only criteria. For many years when I was playing the game, I actually thought one of the criteria is that a batter should play a shot uh, at the ball for buys to be given. No, the law tells us only one. It should not touch the bat or person. So when it comes to playing a shot, we will see it in the next point when we come to leg buys. But for buys, all that needs to happen, the ball that was delivered should not touch the bat or or the person. If uh, that delivery was a noble, that noble will stand and together with the buys will be added to the scorebook. So now we've covered buys. Let's have a look at what the law say, what leg buys is. So now again, a ball that gets delivered. Now this time, so when it comes to buys, the ball should not touch the bat or person. When it comes to leg buys, now the ball touches the person or the protective equipment of the striker. But there are two conditions that needs to be met for leg buys to be given. So again, just to go uh, the definition of leg buys, should strike the person or the protective equipment. So, yes, I know the law say leg by, so you might think I should only struck uh, the leg. No, any part of the person, whether it's the leg, the shoulder, uh, the head, any part of the person or the protective equipment. But there are two conditions for leg buys to be scored. What are, the, what are those conditions? First condition, the striker needs to attempt to play the ball with is or her bat. So there needs to be an attempt to play at the ball. That's the first reason. Or try to avoid the, being hit by the ball. An example of this, uh, polar ball's a bouncer and the striker ducks, try to uh, avoid being hit by the ball. And if the ball should then strike the, uh, uh, the person, or let's say goes against the helmet, that meets the condition of a leg bias, and any run scored from that delivery will be captured in the scorebook as leg bias. So again, to summarize, just strike any part of the person or the protective equipment, but these conditions, um, the striker must attempt to play the ball with the bat or try to avoid being hit by the ball. So if that is the case, leg buys can then be scored. If the delivery was a no ball, the one run penalty for the no ball shall also be incurred together with any uh, runs that accrued for this leg buys. 
So now we know when leg pass will be awarded. You know, the two conditions, when it must attempt to play the ball with the bat or try to avoid being hit by the ball. So we know leg pass not to be awarded. Just the opposite of the first two conditions where the striker did not attempt to play the ball with his or her bat, nor did the striker try to avoid being hit by the ball. So if this happens, leg buys then to not be awarded. So now what happens if the striker now plays at the ball, uh, does not attempt to play at the ball, the ball, let's say, hits the pad and the striker decides to, uh, to run or the batter decides to run. The law now tell us, you'll allow the striker to run. Yes, they should not have run. Uh, they should not have taken the single. But the law allows the fielding, uh, the fielding side an opportunity to run out either of the batters. So the law tell us, if there was no attempt to play the ball with the bat, nor try to avoid being hit by the ball, and they do decide to run, the bowlers in umpire only to call and signal dead ball if either the ball reaches the boundary or at the completion of the first run. So if they do decide to run, don't be hasty to call and signal dead ball. You must wait till, until either the ball reaches the boundary or until they've completed the first run. And upon completion of the first run, then you call and signal dead ball. So now then we've just heard that if there's no attempt to play at the ball, nor the striker try to avoid being hit by the ball, you need to call dead ball if the ball reaches the boundary or on the completion of the first run. Those runs then do not be awarded. Then what do you then do? Then the umpire needs to disallow all runs to the batting side. You return any not out batter to either his or uh, original in. So you so if they completed a single, you call and signal dead ball upon completion of the first run. You then send the batters back to the original, the original ends. You send the striker back to the striker's end and you ask the non-striker to come back to the non-striker's end for the next delivery. If there was a no ball, you signal it to the scorers. You shall award any five penalty runs that's applicable except for penalty runs under law 28.3 and that is protective helmets belonging to the fielding side. Next law is substitutes and fielders absence. Let's see what the law say, what a substitute is and when you can allow a substitute. So when it comes to substitute fielders, the umpire to allow a substitute fielder if the umpires are satisfied that a fielder has either become injured or ill and that this injury or illness happened during the match. Fielders should not be coming into the game with a, an injury or an illness. Must have happened um, after the game has started. So if that is the case, fielder became injured or ill, you'll allow a substitute fielder. Or for any wholly acceptable reason, you shall also allow a substitute fielder. Just an example of a wholly acceptable uh, reason, um, you'll, you'll find in the Cricket South Africa um, provincial competition, there are many uh, students at university studying, and uh, let's say on a Saturday morning from 9 till 11, they'll write uh, um, an exam, so they will be uh, they will be arriving late at the field on the Saturday morning. So the game usually starts at 10. So you will allow a substitute fielder to feel in the place of the student that is busy writing an exam. That's just an example of a wholly acceptable reason why you will allow a substitute fielder. The law also tell us that you shall not allow a substitute fielder for comfort breaks. So now you've allowed a substitute to come onto the field. Law tell us that that substitute shall not be allowed to bowl, bat, or act as captain. But 
you may allow the substitute to be the wicket keeper. One condition, consent of the umpires. So what happens if a fielder is absent or leaving the field of play? How do you deal with it? Before I go into this law, just a quick bit of background. So for many years, the law, when it comes to substitute fielders, all the law said to us was, if the fielder tells you the fielder is uh, injured or ill, you will allow a substitute fielder. So what the, what the uh, fielders did was um, players start abusing this law. So what they did, you'll find the opening uh, bowler bowling a five-over spell, then tell, go to the umpire saying, umpire, um, I've injured my hamstring, I need to go off for treatment. The, that opening bowler would then sit in the dressing room, uh, relax, go take a shower, uh, um, uh, let the physio uh, look at him, have a massage. Two hours later, that bowler would then return to the field and then bowl said the second spell. Then, after bowling the second spell, would then leave the field again. And this is one example how fielders abuse the substitute fielder rule. The lawmakers then decided, let's tighten up this law. So what did they do? They say, they decided that if a fielder comes to you and informing you that he or she is injured or ill and needs to leave the field, you'll allow it. But they first need to inform the umpire that they're leaving the field and the reason why they're leaving the field. So just a bit of practical uh, um, advice as well. So if when a player comes to you informing, the, informing you that EOC is leaving the field to have, uh, um, to have an injury seen to, you'll allow it. You write the name of the uh, fielder down. You write the reason why the field is leaving, and importantly, you need to write the time the field is leaving. You are going to see um, in a later point why it is important to write down this time. Then, that fielder or that injured fielder that now went off the field, before coming back onto the field of play, needs to get the consent, consent of either of the umpires. Why do they need to get the consent of the umpire? Because the umpire needs to make a note when the fielder returned to the field of, of play. So now you need to inform the umpire when you go off, the umpire, umpire will make a note. You need to inform the umpire when you return, and you also need to make a note. Why is that important? Because the law tells us that the injured fielder is not permitted to bowl until that injured fielder having been back on the field of play for the same amount of time that the player was off the field, max 90 minutes. This is known as penalty time. I'll use an example to illustrate this. So at 10.30, the field uh, f uh, player X comes to you informing you that umpire, um, I need my hamstring to be looked at. May I leave the field? You'll say uh, yes. You'll write down the fielder's name. You write down the reason, hamstring, and you write down the time, 10.30. 20 minutes later, the fielder waves at you, informing you that UC wants to come back on. You'll then make a note when the uh, fielder came back on, 10.50. As the fielder comes back onto the field, 10.30 off, 10.50 back on. That is 20 minutes that the fielder was off the field. You will now inform the uh, injured player that UC was off for 20 minutes. You'll also inform the fielding captain. Now that player needs to wait for 20 minutes before UC can bowl again. So if the injured fielder returned at 10.50 and was off for 20 minutes before that injured fielder can bowl again, needs to be on the field for 20 minutes. So at 11.10, that injured fielder can bowl again. So off for 20, needs to be on the field for the same amount of time, which is 20 minutes before he or she can bowl again. There is a max according to the law, and the max is 90 minutes. 
can you, uh, there is disturbance in the background. Can you please mute your microphones? Thank, I still hear background noise. Please mute your microphones. Thank you so much. So there is a max of 90 minutes. So what this maximum uh, means is, let's say a player leaves the field at 11 o'clock and that player only returns 4 o'clock the afternoon. When can that player bowl again? The law tell us, even though the player, player was off for, for three, four hours, there is a maximum penalty time of 90 minutes. So fielder may bowl again if your fielder returns at 4 o'clock at 17.30. After 90 minutes, that player is allowed to bowl. If a player leaves the field before having served all his or her penalty time, balance is carried forward as unserved penalty time. Penalty time does not disappear. In a five-day test match, many a player think on day one, at the end of day one, penalty time will disappear. When they start day two, they will start uh, afresh with no penalty time. No, penalty time gets carried over into day two. It gets carried over into the next innings. So penalty time does not disappear. If a player leaves the field on more than one occasion and having not served up all um, unserved penalty time, penalty time just gets added. Player goes off for 20 minutes, then come back on for, fi for five minutes, then go off again for, for 30 um, minutes. You will add the unserved penalty time each on each occasion. A scheduled interval like lunch, tea time, change of innings, drinks interval, any other agreed interval, these scheduled intervals does not get added to any penalty time that the player owes, nor does it count against the player. Just an example of, of this, uh, 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 lunch is at 12 o'clock, uh, player X leaves at the field at 11.40 due to a hamstring injury. So at 11.40, player X left, lunch is at 12 o'clock. Player X returns with the side at 12.40 after lunch. How much penalty time does the injured player owe us? Only 20 minutes. You must not add the lunch interruption to any playing time that the injured player owe us. Penalty time or, or a, a definition of penalty time is time, playing time, that the player is not on the field. Again, playing time. You don't add or subtract lunch intervals, tea intervals, change of innings intervals, only playing time that the player is not on the field of, of play. We've covered how, you, how to handle scheduled breaks. What about an unscheduled break? An example of this is uh, what, what happens if there's a rain interruption? or you go off for bad light. The law tells us that there are two instances and there are certain criteria for the two instances. When it comes to an unscheduled break, like a rain interruption, the law allows us to offset or subtract this rain interruption against any penalty time that the player might owe us, provided that the fielder that left the field when it started to rain, that player needs to, if that player takes the field on the resumption of play, that injured player can offset that whole unscheduled break against any penalty time that the player may owe. Secondly, if a fielder was not on the field of play when it started to rain, if that is the case, for that player to offset or to subtract the unscheduled break against any penalty time that the UC may uh, owe us, that injured player needs to personally inform you when he or she is able to participate. And from that moment that the player personally inform you, that is when you can start offset the unscheduled break against any penalty time that the player may owe us. I mentioned earlier that penalty time doesn't disappear. It gets gets carried forward into the next day, gets, gets carried forward into the next innings of the match. It does not get carried forward into a next game, but 
for uh, let's say our test mats, it gets carried forward into day two, day three, day four, day five, uh, or into a next innings. Earlier, I mentioned that why the lawmakers tightened the, the law, players abused it. Um, they would fake injuries. We uh, umpires would not know whether the injury is genuine or, or, uh, or when the player is faking it. So they then uh, change the law where they allow you to go off, but you need to serve beyond the field of play for the same amount of time that you're off the field of play. But the lawmakers also realized th uh, that there are times when certain thing uh, happens on the field of play and then they'll allow penalty time to not be incurred. So what is that incident? Law tell us that if a player suffers an external blow during the game and needs to leave the field or is unable to take the field. And the emphasis here is on external blow. So if there's an external blow that happened during the match and while play is in progress and the player needs to leave the field, any time that that player is off the field, will no penalty time will be incurred. So an example of this external uh, blow. Uh, if you can visualize, um, let's say um, a gully fielder, a bowler bowls a short ball, the batter uh, cuts the ball straight to the gully fielder, gully fielder miss, misses the ball, but the ball now splits the webbing of the fielder. There's a little bit of blood around, player then asks you, may I leave the field to have the injury looked at? So that's an example of an external blow where the ball went against the hand. Player needed um, treatment. Let's say that player left the field at 10.30, came back at 10.40. That 10 minutes, because this was an external blow, the um, injured fielder does not need to serve any penalty time. The injured fielder can bowl immediately upon return, in my example, at 10.40. Again, external blow, as long as you happen during the match on the field of play and uh, and you saw it happen, there was an external blow, doesn't uh, just have to be ball against uh, the hand, it can be uh, ball gets hit high up in the air, two fielders converge on the ball to take the cats, they run into each other and, and let's say the elbow of the one fielder goes into the ribs of the other fielder. Again, that's also an example of an external blow if the fielder needs, one of the fielders needs to leave the field to have um, the medic look at uh, his or her ribs, you'll allow it. Any time off does not need to incur, incur any penalty time because that's an example of an external blow that the umpire saw. Also, no penalty time to be incurred if a player is either absent or has left the field for a wholly acceptable reason. Earlier, we mentioned the importance of when a player leaves the field. You, you need to write down the player's name, at the time the player left the field, as well as why the player is leaving the field. And it's important that the player needs to inform you that when you see returns, because you need to calculate the penalty time that the player owes you. Now, what happens if the player, the injured player went off? but now returns to the field of play without your permission. That player does not inform you that he or she is returning. It happened quite quite often. Uh, players would, um, injured players would go off, there's a drinks interval, and then while having drinks, they'll make the swap. And then suddenly after drinks, here you see the injured player back on the, onto the field. So what happens if that player turn, returns without permission? Law tell us as soon as that player that came onto the field without permission comes into contact with the ball, that moment that the player contacts uh, makes contact with the ball, the ball to become dead immediately. Five penalty runs to be awarded to the batting side. Runs completed by the batters to be scored, including the run in progress if they crossed at the instant when the player touched the ball. Ball not to count as one for the over. The umpire shall inform everyone of what just happened and also report this to the governing body. So you can see there's quite a, a, a serious penalty if a player comes onto the field without permission. 
a batter's innings and runners. So when it comes to runners, the law still allows for runners, but in many competitions across the world, there's a playing condition that states that runners are not allowed in those various competitions. That is a playing condition, but according to the laws of cricket, the laws of cricket still allows for runners. When does the batter's innings commence? The innings of the two opening bats and any new batters on the resumption of play after the call of time shall start at the call of play. Any other time, the batter's innings to be, shall be considered to have commenced as soon as the batter first steps onto the field of play. So the batter's innings does not come in when, when commence when UC uh, gets to the, the, the wicket. No, it starts as soon as that batter put his or her foot across the ropes. We saw earlier when a member of the fielding side goes off and that member then needs to serve penalty time. Similarly, if a member of the batting side has any unserved penalty time, that player then shall not be allowed to bat until that penalty time has been served. However, if the unserved penalty time has not expired, that player may bat after his or her side lost five wickets. In the event of any unscheduled stoppage, stoppage like rain, the stoppage time after the batter notifies an umpire in person will then offset or you can subtract uh, it from that time when the batter personally informs you. Batter retiring, does the law allow a batter to retire? Yes. The law tells us a batter may retire at any time after the ball is dead. The umpire then needs to be informed of the reason why the batter is retiring. Because now the law tells us if a batter retires because of in illness, injury or any unavoidable cause, the batter is then entitled to resume his or her innings. If they don't, then in the scorebook, that batter will be, retire, will be indicated as retired, not out. So that's for injury, illness, or any unavoidable cause. But if the batter retires for any other reason that other than illness, injury, or any unavoidable cause, the batter may only resume his or her innings with the consent of the opposing captain. If the captain say no, that batter is not allowed to resume his or her innings. And how will you be recorded in the scorebook? You'll, that batter will then be recorded as retired out compared to the in point number two where you will be retired not out. The law allows the striker to play at the ball. The law tells us a striker is allowed to play at the ball. The striker is also allowed a legitimate second strike to protect his or her wicket and the fielders nor the keeper shall not interfere with the strikers right to play at the ball. However, the law tells us that for the striker to play at the ball, there needs to be some part of the striker whether grounded or raised to be on the pitch. If, if there's no part of the striker's bat or person on the pitch, if the striker leaves the pitch to play at the ball, either umpire immediately to call and signal dead ball. Practice on the field. Are you allowed to practice on the field? Yes or no. The law divides the field into two portions. You'll find the match pitch and the square, and then there's also the outfield. Let's first cover the match pitch and the square. Let's see what the law tells us. Are you allowed to practice on the match pitch? And are you allowed to practice on the square? When it comes to the match pitch, law is quite clear. No practice at 
any time, on any day of the match, on the match pitch. What about the rest of the square? Also, the Lord tell us, no practice on the rest of the square at any time on any day of the match, except with the approval of the umpires. So point one on the match pitch, with, uh, if you look at the picture with the wicket tree pitch, no practice at all on the match pitch. On the rest of the square, also no practice, except if the umpires uh, approve that you allow uh, and they allow you to practice on um, on the square. Uh, just an example of this, um, at the international and provincial grounds, you'll um, often find what we call bowling strips. They are at the furthest end of the square, where these where you see the two furthest red lines on the right and on the left. So at international and provincial uh, matches, the, the squares are, are huge. Uh, at Newlands, I know there's about 15, 16 uh, strips. And usually the curator will prepare bowling strips on those um, far ends of, of both sides for the um, for the sides to warm up before the game, um, during intervals after the game. But otherwise, the rest of the square, no practice on it. So now we've covered the pitch and the rest of the square. What about the outfield? The law say yes. On the outfield, you are allowed to to practice before the start of play, after the close of play, during lunch and tea intervals, and between innings. There's one exception. Unless the umpires feels that if they'll allow practice on the outfield, it may cause significant deterioration to the condition of the outfield. If that is the case, the umpires can ask both sides not to practice on the outfield. But otherwise, yes, before play starts, after the close of play, and during lunch and tea intervals, and as well as the interval between innings. So that's now before the game starts and during uh, intervals and after play starts. Are you allowed to practice while the game is in progress? So between the call of play and the call of time, can, uh, can any practice happen? The law allow for this, but few conditions needs to be met. Firstly, when it comes to practice between the call of play and the call of time or while play is in progress, only the fielders may participate in such practice. So only the 11 fielders on the field at that time, or if there's a substitute, uh, substituting for someone, also allowed, but the 11 fielders on the field, they are allowed to practice while plays in progress. No other ball than the match ball to be used for this particular practice. No bowling practice to take place in the area between the square and the boundary in a direction parallel to the match pitch. The umpires are satisfied that it will not contravene either changing the condition of the match ball or time wasting by the fielding side. Are you allowed a trial run up? Yes, the law, the law allows a bowler to have a trial run-up, provided that the umpire is satisfied that this trial run-up will not contravene uh, the law 41.9, which is time-wasting, also does not contravene 41.12, which is fielder damaging the pits. So what happens if a player now contravenes uh, these uh, points that we've just covered? They now, let's say, do bowl on the match pitch. What do you do? Law tell us that if there is a contravention, umpire then to warn the player that this type of practice is not permitted. Inform the other umpire, and as soon as practicable, both captains, for the, re for the reason of this action. If the contravention was by a batter to wicket, the umpire then to inform the other batter and each incoming batter that there's been a warning. 
and this warning shall apply to the team throughout the remainder of the match. So you'll start with a first a warning. So what happens if any of the players again during this match contravenes practice? What do you then do? You've already given a warning. Now you'll award five penalty runs and you'll inform everyone and you report this to the governing body. Last law that I'm covering for this evening before handing over to Tom. Wicket keeper. When it comes to the protective equipment of the wicket keeper, only the wicket keeper is permitted to wear gloves and external leg guards i.e. the keeper is allowed to have the pads outside the trousers. It can be external. The keeper may choose to uh, put the, um, the keeper's pads inside the trousers, no problem, but the, but the keeper, if he or she wants to have it externally, no problem, the law allows for it. And the gloves now worn by the keeper and the external leg guards, the keeper can use this for the purpose of fielding the ball. If by the wicket keeper's action, actions and positioning, when the ball comes into place, it's obvious to the umpires that the keeper now is not able to carry out the normal duties of the wicket keeper, that keeper shall now forfeit the right to be seen or to be recognized as a keeper. I'll use an example of this. The bowler comes into bowl and you see the keeper, uh, uh, let's say it's a, it's a medium pace bowler or even a fast bowler, but the keeper stands right on the boundary, 80 meters away or 80 meters behind the stumps on the boundary. Would you say that is a keeper? The law tells us no. The, due to the positioning of the keeper, that is not seen as a keeper. Now that keeper forfeits the rights to be seen as a keeper. So uh, what rights does the keeper have? The keeper has gloves and the keeper can put on external leg guards. So if the keeper is now standing on the boundary for a bowler, which is 80 meters away, keeper is not a keeper anymore. That, that means the keeper is then not allowed to use his or her gloves anymore. We're not stopping the keeper from standing on the boundary if the keeper so uh, wishes, or, but that keeper will now not be seen according to the laws as a keeper. If that keeper keeps on the gloves and then touches the ball, that would be seen as illegal fielding. So the keeper can stand there, but the keeper then has to remove the gloves as well as the pads because that keeper is not seen in the law as a keeper anymore. When it comes to the keeper's gloves, Uh, Abdullah, you're on mute. Um, uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, my elbow uh, pressed the mute button. Uh, thank you so much, Tom. No problem. Go ahead. When it comes to the keeper's gloves, no webbing between the fingers. The law allows for a single piece of non stress material between the index finger and the thumb, and this is only a means of supporting the, the area between the thumb and the index uh, finger. So uh, many years ago, you'll, you'll find the webbing being a, a, a huge piece of material that was um, outlawed um, about 15, 20 years ago. Now, only thing that's allowed on the, on the gloves in terms of webbing is the single piece of non stretch material. In terms of the positioning of the keeper, the law tells us that the keeper to remain behind the wicket from the moment the ball comes into play until the ball is delivered by the bowler, unless the ball touches the bat or person of the striker, passes the wicket at the strikers in, or the striker attempts a run. 
So from the moment the ball comes into play, the keeper needs to stay behind the wicket at all times. When can this, the keeper move in front of the of the stumps? As soon as the ball touches the bat or person of the striker, or the striker attempts a run. And the keeper must also wait till it passes the wicket at the striker's uh, end. What happens if the keeper contravenes this? The strikers in umpire to call and signal no ball as soon as the ball is delivered. Let's watch the video. Hello guys, welcome to my channel. First, let's watch a footage from the T20 match between India and Australia, which happened on 21st of November 2018. Australian wicketkeeper Alex Carey ends up touching the stumps before the ball reaches him. And after referring to the third umpire, it was declared a no ball. So what do you guys think about it? It's a no ball because he touched the stumps? Well, let's find out. Before going any further, let us take a look at the restrictions a wicketkeeper has. He has restrictions both on his movement and position. According to cricket law, after the ball comes into play, well, to know when the ball comes into play, watch the above video. And before the ball reaches the striker, it is unfair if the wicketkeeper makes any significant movement. In this case, umpire will call it dead ball and further action will be invalid. However, he is allowed to make certain movements. Let's take a look at them. He is allowed to move a few steps forward for a slower delivery, but doing so should not bring the stumps in his reach. He is allowed to move laterally, like this wicketkeeper, in response to the direction in which the ball has been delivered. He is allowed to move in response to the stroke that the striker is playing, like this wicketkeeper does, but he has to make sure that he follows the law 27.3.1. Let's see what exactly that law is. The wicketkeeper shall remain wholly behind the wicket. He can't even be parallel to the stumps. From the moment the ball comes into play till either of the following things happens. Ball touches the bat or body of the striker. So he can come ahead of the stumps right after the ball touches the bat or batsman's body. Just like this keeper does. Next case. He can come ahead after the ball passes the stumps and he can come ahead if the striker starts running without playing the shot. It will be called a no ball in case of keeper violating this law. In the case of Alex Carey, ball had touched the bat when he broke the wicket. Hence, this is not a violation of law. But he was parallel to the stumps before the ball made contact with the bat. Hence, it was called a no ball. Another instance which needs a mention here is Andy Flowers incident. He is clearly ahead of the stumps even before the ball reached the batsman. It should have been called a no ball but the umpire didn't notice it at all and unfortunately it costed Ridley Jacobs his wicket. Still have any doubts with this? Do let me know in the comment section. If you like the video, hit the like button, share with all your friends. To never miss another update from our channel, don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification button. So we've just covered movement by the keeper. So after the ball comes into play and before it reaches the striker, the law tells us it's unfair for the keeper to significantly change his or her position. Except for the following three instances. Keepers allowed to move a few paces forward for slower delivery unless the, the two or three paces forward brings the keeper within the reach of the wicket. That should not be allowed. But otherwise, one or two steps forward, no problem. Keepers also allowed lateral movement in response to the direction in which the ball has been delivered. And also, the keepers allowed to move in response to the stroke that the striker is playing or that the striker's action suggests he or she intends to play. So if there is unfair movement by the keeper, either umpire to call and signal dead ball and, in, and shall then inform the other umpire why. 
Additionally, the bowlers in umpire, if there was a no ball or wide, that's all count. Five penalty runs to be awarded to the batting side. Inform the captain of the fielding side. Why? Inform the batters and, when possible, captain of the batting side and then to report this to the governing body. If you're looking at the, the picture, it's uh, Timber Bavuma playing a lap sweep. So as soon as Timber indicated that he was going to play the lap sweep, the keeper is allowed to move to the leg side. Interference with the keeper by the striker in playing at the ball or in legally defending his or her wicket. The striker interferes with the wicket keeper. The striker shall not be out except if the striker prevents the ball from being caught. Then the striker shall be given out obstructing the field. That is all the laws I'm covering for this evening. I'm now handing over to Tom. Uh, Thomas, over to you. Thank you very much, Abdullah. And good evening to all the candidates. This evening, I'm taking you through laws 28, 29, 30, and 31. And we're going to start with law 28, the fielder. Of course, Abdullah has just covered Law 27, the wicket keeper. So I'm going to start you off with a question. And I want you to answer before we watch the video. Is a normal fielder allowed to use wicket keeper equipment? Abdullah did al allude to this. So if you listened carefully, you should know what the answer is. But please, before we see this incident involving Baba Zam, let us all type into the chat box. Is a normal fielder allowed to use wicket keeper equipment? Yes or no? Please submit your answer into the chat box now. And I shall play the video for us to see the answer to this question. Abdullah, please let me know if there is no sound. I think there should be. caught the ball and then that was deemed illegal fielding as you can see at the bottom of the screen right the first delivery there's five penalty runs and that's because of illegal fielding because barbarism picked up rizwan's glove and used it to catch the ball to catch the ball. so that is the answer to my question a normal fielder is not allowed to use wicket keeper equipment baba azam captain of pakistan does not know that particular law he does now certainly after those five penalty runs were awarded to the west indies against his action so it's important for us as umpires to know our laws whether we are umpiring at the lowest level or the highest level of the game so that we can educate players and be sure to implement the right punishments when required by the law. So let's look at illegal fielding in detail. The law says that a fielder may field the ball with any part of his or her person. However, he or she will be deemed to have fielded the ball illegally if while the ball is in play, he or she willfully uses anything other than part of his or her person to field the ball. And obviously with that equipment not being part of Baba Azam's person, 
or his equipment to use, it was deemed illegal fielding. If a fielder extends his or her closing and uses it to field the ball, that will also be deemed illegal fielding. We've got a picture on the next slide that depicts that. And if a player discards a piece of clothing, equipment, or any other object which subsequently makes contact with the ball, that will then be deemed illegal fielding. And that describes the incident involving Baba Azam that we've just seen. Quite often you have wicket keepers who run to the ball to field it and because they want to throw without their glove on, they will discard the glove as Rizwan did in that particular incident. And the law tells us here that if they throw the ball and the ball hits the glove, even if it's on the ground, because it was discarded by the wicket keeper, then five penalty runs will be awarded to the batting side. And of course, the ball immediately becomes dead. Uh, however, it's good practice for the on-field umpire either one of them to call and signal dead ball because as we have just noticed a lot of players do not know this law quite importantly it is not illegal fielding if the ball in play makes contact with a piece of clothing equipment or any other object which has accidentally fallen from the fielder's person quite often what happens is when a fielder is fastly in pursuit of the ball running towards the boundary, that fielder's cap can fly off because of the wind. If the fielder fields the ball and then throws it back in towards the wicket keeper, but the throw is short and bounces on the cap that has accidentally fallen from that fielder's head would that be a dead ball and five penalty runs would it be considered as illegal fielding the law tells us no that will not be considered illegal fielding because the cap has flown off the head of the fielder accidentally sometimes what you see is especially when a catch goes high up in the air Fielders tend to take the cap off so that their vision of the ball is not disturbed. If in that instance, because the fielder has taken the cap off, removed it deliberately, it, is not it has not accidentally fallen from the fielder's head. If he attempts to catch the ball, the ball goes through his or her hands and falls onto the cap on the floor that's been discarded. That will unfortunately be considered as illegal fielding. Why? Because that cap in the incident I've just explained was discarded on purpose. If it's not discarded on purpose and it's blown off by the wind or the speed at which the field is running and the throw makes contact with the cap, then that shall be play on. The ball will not become dead and no penalty runs will be awarded to the batting side. I hope you are able to differentiate between accidentally falling from a fielder's person and willfully discarded by a fielder. So here is a picture of a fielder clearly willfully extending his clothing or equipment to field the ball. This is considered illegal fielding and will be penalized by five penalty runs. And of course, the ball becomes automatically dead as soon as the ball makes contact with 
the extended clothing or equipment. So what do the umpires do in the act of illegal fielding? As I mentioned, the ball shall immediately become dead, but it is good umpiring practice for either umpire to call and signal dead ball just to alert everyone that the ball is now dead. Of course, the penalty for a no ball or wide will always stand if applicable. Any runs completed by the batters shall be credited to the batting side, as well as the run in progress if the batters had crossed at the instant of the illegal fielding. Ball shall not count as one of the over. And we shall award five penalty runs to the batting side. Lastly, we shall apply the informing and reporting procedures. The informing procedures happen during the game and the reporting procedure happens after the day's play. We've spoken in previous laws about protective helmets belonging to the fielding side. If you have a fast bowler bowling from the one end and you've got a spin bowler bowling from the other end, when the spin bowler is bowling, the wicketkeeper will wear his or her helmet because they are standing up to the stumps. So that is a way of protecting them from the ball or even the batter's bat hitting their head. But when the fast bowler is bowling and the wicketkeeper is standing back a few meters behind the striker's stumps, then the wicketkeeper does not need to wear a helmet. What does he or she do with that helmet? They put it behind them in line with the stumps. But because it is willfully discarded and placed behind the wicket keeper, if the ball comes into contact with that discarded wicket keeper or short leg fielder's helmet, then the ball shall immediately become dead. And again here, quite often what happens, I've been in a scenario before where the ball went through the wicket keeper's legs and hit the stumps. Apologies, it hit the uh, wicket keeper's helmet, which was placed behind him. But not everybody saw the ball hit the wicket keeper's helmet placed behind the wicket keeper. So even though the law tells us that the ball automatically becomes dead, it is good umpiring practice for either umpire. And I was the striker's end umpire when it happened in the game of mine many years ago. Uh, the bowler's end umpire, his view of the ball hitting the wicket keeper's helmet, which was placed behind the wicket keeper, the bowler's end umpire's view of the ball hitting the helmet was obstructed by the wicket keeper. So I, seeing that my partner did not notice the ball hitting the wicket keeper's helmet, I called and signaled dead ball so that everybody was aware that the ball had hit the helmet. Even though it is unintentional for this to happen, because the helmet was placed purposefully by the fielding side, they will be penalized. We will award five penalty runs to the batting side. Any runs completed by the batters before the ball strikes the protective helmet shall be scored together with the run in progress if the batters had already crossed at the instant of the ball striking the discarded helmet. Abdullah talked about movement by 
the wicket keeper. Let's see what the law has to say about movement by fielders. Any movement by any fielder, excluding the wicket keeper, after the ball comes into play and before the ball reaches the striker, is unfair, except for a few circumstances. Let's have a look at what those circumstances are. Minor adjustments to stance or position in relation to the striker's wicket. We all learnt as young cricketers growing up that we should walk in with the bowler as fielders. So this is exactly what the law is referring to here. Movement by any fielder other than a close fielder towards the striker or the striker's wicket that does not significantly alter the position of the fielder. So this is walking in with the bowler. Uh, what's important here is that the fielder needs to be walking towards the striker or the striker's wicket. Sometimes, especially if there's a free hit, Fielders prefer to walk backwards away from the striker. Law does not allow for this. What we do allow when there is a free hit is for fielders to stand from their normal position, which is usually about five meters inside of the 30 yard circle we do allow them to go back onto the 30 yard circle because in technical terms it is still the same fielding position um, it's just slightly further away from the striker than normal what we do not allow is a catching fielder for example a short cover to move from his or her position of 15 meters away from the bat all the way to the edge of the circle which is 27 meters away from the middle stump of the striker that is not allowed because a short cover fielder moving to the ring would be changing positions to a extra cover position okay so keep that in mind that slight adjustments and movement towards the striker's wicket are allowed, but changes in position are not allowed while the bowler is running up. The same way that movement by a wicket keeper in response to the stroke that the striker is playing or that his or her actions suggest that he or she intends to play is allowed. Fielders are also allowed to anticipate where the ball is going to go before the striker has played the shot. However, if the fielder is in front of the wicket in view of the striker, then even though this law allows anticipation of the shot law 41 distraction deception or obstruction of the striker while waiting to receive the delivery that law disallows a fielder who is in view of the striker from moving before the striker has had an opportunity to play at the ball. What is allowed is a any fielder behind the striker to move in response to the stroke that the striker is playing or that his or her actions suggest that he or she intends to play. So the first slip fielder, you saw it in the picture where Bavuma got caught by the Bangladeshi wicketkeeper. The Bangladeshi wicketkeeper was far down the leg side. That was allowed. The first slip fielder was already running as well in anticipation of that lap sweep. Um, 
and was out of his position at first slip and was almost behind the stumps, almost in the wicket keeper's position when the ball was struck by Bavuma. So if a fielder is not in sight of the striker, then he or she is allowed by law to move in anticipation of the shot that is being played. So what if that movement is unfair? What if a fielder runs backwards 10 meters as the bowler is running up? What should we as umpires do? The law tells us that in the event of such unfair movement, either umpire shall call and signal dead ball and inform the other umpire of the reason for doing so. The bowler's end umpire shall then award the one penalty run for wide or no ball if applicable, always the case. And because of this unfair movement, we shall award five penalty runs to the batting side and once again, apply the informing procedure during the match and the reporting procedure after the day's play. That is law 28, the fielder done. Now we move on to law 29, the wicket is down. What does the law mean when they say that the wicket is down? Let us watch a video to explain this concept. The wicket is down. The wicket is put down when one or both bales are removed from the top of the stumps or a stump is struck out of the ground. The situation can be brought about in the following ways. By the ball, by the batsman's bat, by the batsman's bat if he or she lets go of it or even by some flying part of a bat if it breaks, by the batsman's clothing or body or some part of his or her equipment falling off, by a fielder with his or her hand or arm, providing the same hand is holding the ball. If the bale merely bounces and comes to rest back on the stumps, then that is not out. The wicket is down at the precise moment that both ends of either bale are removed from the stumps. Right about now. Should you have further questions on this tricky subject, such as how to put the wicket down when one or both bales have already been removed, head over to Law 29 in MCC's The Laws of Cricket. All right, so we've had the law explained to us. And for those of you who don't know, all of these animations are available on the Laws of Cricket app, available both on Android and Apple devices. Uh, so please go to your Google Play Store or your Apple App Store and download the Laws of Cricket app and you can watch all of these animation videos on there. You can also watch them on YouTube. So up to you how you want to get a hold of them. So now that we've seen the theory and with a bit of visuals, let's put our newly acquired knowledge into practice. I have a scenario for you in the next video. I'm sure you've all seen it. It did the rounds, especially during uh, the early parts of COVID lockdowns. I want you to tell me, is this striker out or not out? Is the wicket down or not down in this scenario? And there are going to be two scenarios that I take you through. So I want you to put one out or not out. And then for the following scenario, I want you to put two out or not out in the chat box. So here's our first scenario for whether the wicket is down or not in this scenario. So after you've watched the scenario, you can type into the chat box one out or one not out. And then we'll move on to the next scenario. Oh, good ball. Good appeal from deep cover from Tricky. Well, wow, amazing.
Uh, out or not out? Type in the chat box now, one out or one not out, if you haven't done so yet. I'm gonna play the rest of the video and then we will discuss these uh, two pictures at the end of my presentation. These, sorry, it's gonna be one video and one picture. Well, uh, this lodge onto the top of the stumps. Umpires had a little chat and uh, decided it's not out. Right, now we have this scenario. So let us assume the delivery we've just seen in the previous video, the bale comes off the top of the stumps and the off stump moves wide of the middle stump and the off bale lodges between middle and off stump and lands up three quarters of the way up those stumps. What do we as umpires say here? Out or not out, please type into the chat box two out or two not out. And we will go through those answers when we go through the chat box after our virtual hands Q&A. So two scenarios for you there, one video, one picture. I need you to type in one out or one not out, and then I need you to type in two out or two not out. Thank you very much for your participation, and Langton will take us through these scenarios uh, if he is available tonight. Um, he said he might or might not make it. Let's hope he's with us to talk us through these two scenarios later. We saw a little glimpse at the end of the animation about how to put a wicket down by holding the ball in one hand and the stump in the other hand and together uprooting the stump from the ground. That is another way that we can put the wicket down. This is specifically required if the bales have fallen off the top of the stumps in a previous movement. So imagine that the ball had been thrown by a fielder to try and attempt a run out and flicked one of the stumps and the both bales had come off, the ball had ricocheted towards the boundary, the batters had carried on running for overthrows, and now the ball came back to the bowler to try and affect another run out with the bells on the ground, as you can see in this picture. What does the bowler have to do to put the wicket down for a second time? Well, if the bells are not on the top of the stumps, then this picture depicts what the fielder needs to do to put the wicket down for a second time. Is he correctly putting the wicket down in this picture? No, he is not. Why? Because the ball is not in contact with the stump in this picture when he removes the stump from the ground. If one of the bells has previously been removed, then another way that you can put the wicket down for a second time in the same play 
is by simply removing the other bale. OK. And this is important for us when we come to the mode of dismissal laws on Thursday. To remember that. If one bell is off. To put the wicket down. For a second time, we can simply remove. The other bell. That is that for law 29, putting the wicket down. Now we move on to law 30, better out of his or her ground. And once again, we've got an animation video to explain this law to us. Batsman out of his or her ground. When a batsman is out of his or her ground, he or she risks being stumped or run out. So when is a batsman out of his or her ground? According to Law 30, a batsman shall be considered to be out of his or her ground unless the bat he or she is holding or some part of the batsman's person is grounded behind the popping crease at that end. Here, for example, the bat is on the crease marking, but not behind it, which means the batsman is most definitely out. But would the batsman be out now? Both the bat and the batsman are over the line, but neither the bat nor any part of the batsman's person is, is grounded, i.e. in contact with the ground. So, yes, that's out again. This being cricket, there is an exception to this part of the law. If a batsman, who must be running or diving, has already made his or her ground, either with the bat or any part of the body, but subsequently loses contact with the ground while continuing his or her forward momentum as the wicket is put down, he or she will be not out. Next question, and this can be a bit of a headache, what constitutes each batsman's ground? Well, when one batsman is in a ground, i.e. grounded behind a popping crease, then the ground at the other end belongs to the other batsman. If neither is in his or her ground, for example, when they are both running between wickets or even stationary, each ground belongs to the batsman who is nearest to it. If both batsmen are level, then where they were before drawing level is the deciding factor. Of course, this being cricket, there are further delightful complications, such as two batsmen in the same ground, or three when you have a striker with a runner. But never fear, all mental anguish will clear with a little quiet meditation and reference to Law 30 in the Blue Book. But right, position of the non-striker when the bowler comes in to bowl. What does the law say? Where should the non-striker stand? The non-striker, when standing at the bowler's end, should be positioned on the opposite side of the wicket to that from which the ball is being delivered unless a request to do otherwise is granted by the umpire. Uh, sometimes you play on a strip that is right on the edge of the square. Abdullah mentioned about the square earlier, and there could perhaps be a, um, a bump in the field where the square ends and the outfield starts, and it's not very comfortable for the non-striker to run up and down that particular line where the bump occurs. Um, so yes, the, the law tells us that the non-striker should be running on the side that the bowler is not bowling from. However, if the non-striker requests 
and it needs to be a reasonable request, uh, then he or she is allowed to run and stand on the side that the bowler is bowling from, but he or she would probably be about five meters away from the bowler when the bowler runs up to deliver. Um, so standing quite wide of the crease. So another top question for all of you. We have a striker who is leaning or sitting on his bat, not holding the bat. Is the striker considered to be in his ground or out of his ground? The bat is clearly grounded behind the popping crease, but it's obvious to see that the bat is not held by the hand or a glove in hand. So let's go three. This is your third out or not out question for the night. So please type in here three out or three not out. As you can see, the wiki keeper has put down one of the bells. That is enough to put the wicket down. So is the striker in his ground or out of his ground? If he is, if you consider him out of his ground, then he will be out uh, stumped or run out, whatever the case might be. So type into the chat box now, please. Three out or three not out. Let's see how much you've learned over the last five lectures and if you're ready to be an umpire. I've given you the answer already. I'm sure you will remember from uh, quite a few conversations we've had about uh, bat in hand or bat not in hand. Abdullah also touched on it in our first lecture when we spoke about um, the glove holding the bat. Because this bat is not held by the glove, then this batter is not considered to be holding the bat. And so the bat is technically not part of him or his person, therefore out. The bat needs to be held in the hand or at least some part of the hand or glove needs to be touching the bat. OK. Last law for the evening before we go into our question and answer session. Is appeals. Top question for all of you once again. If a bowler appeals, does he or she need to tell the umpire what he or she is appealing for? Which mode of dismissal? Or does one appeal cover all modes of dismissals? Let's see what the law says. Firstly, the law says that an umpire is not to give a bowler out without an appeal. That's interesting. So does a bowler need to appeal when he or she has bowled the batter out? Let's read more to find out. The law says that neither umpire shall give a batter out, even though he or she may be out under the laws, unless appealed to by a fielder. This shall not debar a batter who is out under any of the laws from leaving the wicket without an appeal having been made. Note, however, the provision of the next slide. Before we move on to the next slide, I always thought that a bowler or the fielding side does not have to appeal for a batter being out bowled. And you hardly ever see an appeal for a batter being out bowled. 
uh, you usually just see the fielding side celebrating and the batter walking off. But I have had it on a couple of occasions where because of the wind in Cape Town, we were playing without bales on. So now I, as the bowlers and umpire, my view of the stumps being apparently hit by the ball were obstructed. My view was obstructed by the striker because he played a forward defensive or he attempted to play a forward defensive shot on or outside off stump. So he was covering all the stumps. My view of the wicket was obstructed and I did not hear or see the ball apparently nicking the stumps. So the fielding side had to appeal for bold. I had to um, consult with my partner. Because of the wind, we didn't hear. Because of the bales being off, we didn't see. And unfortunately for the fielding side, we had to give the striker not out because neither of us had seen or heard the ball nicking the off stump, which is what the fielding side suggested had happened. So believe it or not, uh, even out bold needs to be appealed for, but obviously a lot of the time it isn't because it is clear and obvious for all to see and the batters usually walk when they are out bold. So what is this provision that the law refers to? What if a batter leaves his or her wicket under the misapprehension of being out? So imagine a batter is clean bowled, but does not hear the call of no ball from the bowler's end because the bowler overstepped. Now the batter, having seen his or her stumps being bowled, starts walking, leaving the crease back to the pavilion because he or she is under the impression that they have been out bowled. And then a fielder, having heard the no ball call, realizes that the batter cannot be out bowled. So then rushes to collect the ball and put the wicket down for a second time to effect a run out. What would we as umpires do here? The law guides us. The law says that an umpire shall intervene if satisfied that a batter not having been given out has left the wicket under a misapprehension of being out. The umpire shall intervening shall call and signal dead ball to prevent any further action by the fielding side and shall recall the batter. What's important here as umpires is we need to be alert to the situation and try and call and signal dead ball in my scenario before that fielder picks the ball up and breaks the wicket for a second time. Uh, why? Because if we do not call and signal dead ball before the fielder runs the batter out who has left the crease under the misapprehension that they are out, uh, then it becomes a very tricky situation for the umpires to handle uh, because we need to call and signal dead ball before that second attempt at dismissing the striker. Okay. A batter may be recalled at any time up to the instant when the ball comes into play for the next delivery, unless it is the final wicket of the innings, in which case it should be up until the instant when the umpires leave the field that a batter may be recalled. 
So how long is an appeal valid for? The law tells us that for an appeal to be valid, it must be made before the bowler begins his or her run up or if the bowler does not have a run up, then before the bowler enters his or her bowling action to deliver the next ball and his or her bowling action is entered into when his or her back foot lands in the delivery stride. And of course, we should not have called time. Anything up to those two points, an appeal is still valid. And of course, all of this is in lime green, so it means it is tested in the level one Cricket South Africa umpire exam that you will be attempting after the end of this course. Quite importantly, the call of over does not invalidate an appeal made prior to the start of the following over, provided that time has not been called. So, what this means is that if a batter on the sixth ball of an over nicked a delivery and was caught behind, but there was no appeal, maybe the it was a very faint nick and nobody heard it, uh, except one player in the fielding side. And that player in the fielding side only went up to the umpire just before the next over started. The law allows the umpire who was at the bowler's end when the batter nicked the ball the law allows the umpire to give the batter out even though that umpire had already called over. Okay, so the call of over does not invalidate an appeal. However, I warn against you giving a batter out after the end of an over when there is a very late appeal because the fielding side wasn't sure, and you probably weren't sure. So rather err on the side of not out in that scenario. How do the fielding side have to appeal? The words, how's that, or any form of how was that constitutes an appeal? In uh, different countries, you have uh, cricketers screaming in different dialects and sounds. I know Abdullah has had uh, SA under 19 versus Sri Lanka under 19, where the Sri Lanka under 19 players, the way they would appeal was Cut! so that um, somehow translated to how was that, um, as Abdullah understood and he accepted that as a form of an appeal. And as I mentioned, one appeal covers all methods of dismissals. Quite often, uh, you do have teams that over appeal and appeal excessively, uh, not just on separate deliveries, but on one delivery, they will carry on how was that? How was that? How was that? How was that? Um, that is outside of the spirit of the game. And you as a bowler's end umpire or even a striker's end umpire are well within your rights to tell them that one appeal is enough for all modes of dismissals. So they do not need to keep repeating themselves. Okay that is an easy way to handle excessive appealing. So who answers which appeals? Let's start with the strikers end umpire, 
who usually stands at square leg or as Abdullah mentioned in the first lecture, can also stand at point. The strikers and umpire shall answer all appeals arising out of laws 35, hit wicket, law 39, stumped, or law 38, run out, when the run out occurs at the wicket keeper's end. The bowler's end umpire shall answer all other appeals. And we will go through all the modes of dismissals on Thursday. So it tells us that there are nine modes of dismissals. The strikers and umpire only answers to, let's call it two and a half of those appeals, of those modes of dismissals. Why? Because a run out can happen either at the wicket keeper's end or at the bowler's end. Okay, that is why sometimes people refer to the bowler's end umpire as the main umpire. I do not like that terminology. Let us stick to the terminology that is in the law. That shows that we read our law and we know our law. It is the bowler's end umpire or it is the striker's end umpire. Um, also using the word main umpire, um, it gives off the opinion or the feeling that the bowler's end umpire is more important than the striker's end umpire. Uh, yes, this law tells us that the bowlers and umpire adjudicates more appeals than the strikers and umpires or more modes of dismissals than the strikers and umpire. However, um, please, guys, let us avoid using the word main umpire because it seems to suggest that the strikers and umpire is less important than the bowlers and umpire and that is not the case on the field both umpires are equal when an appeal is made each umpire shall answer on any matter that falls within his or her jurisdiction when a batter has been given not out either umpire may answer an appeal if it is on a further matter and is within his or her juris jurisdiction. You can quite often have a court behind appeal and a stamping appeal on the same delivery. So it would be for the bowlers and umpire to answer the appeal for court behind, and it would be for the strikers and umpire to answer the appeal for stamping. We spoke in the first lecture about consultation between umpires. Let's expand on this. The law says that each umpire shall answer appeals on matters within his or her own jurisdiction. If an umpire is doubtful at any point that the other umpire may have been in a better position to see, he or she shall consult the latter on this point of fact and shall then give the decision. Uh, quite a common reason for consultation between umpires is when a catch is not easy for the bowler's end umpire to see if it in fact is a clean catch or a fair catch. I had an incident a few years ago. It was free state against KwaZulu Natal inland. KwaZulu Natal inland were bowling and a bowler by the name of uh, Zuma was bowling and he got a thick outside edge of the batter Andris host and the ball was went in the direction of the second slip and the second slip fielder seemed to take a clean catch but i could not see whether it was a fair catch or not why because the bowler in his follow-through 
obstructed my view of the catch. So even though that decision fell under my jurisdiction, because I was unable to determine whether or not the catch was cleanly taken, it was taken very close to the ground. I went to consult with my partner, the strikers and umpire who was standing at square leg, who had an unobstructed view of the fielder completing the catch. So from the information that my partner gave me, I was able to make the decision of whether or not a clean catch was taken. The debate was not whether or not there was a bat on the ball. Uh, that decision I have to make on my own, uh, but I could consult with my partner as to the fairness of the catch. If after consultation there is still doubt remaining, the decision shall be not out. And in fact, that is the decision that we came to because my partner was unsure and I was unsighted. Uh, we gave the batter not out. Um, Pitch Vision, which is the company that streams our first class matches here in South Africa. Uh, Pitch Vision replays, which we are not allowed to use or refer to during the match, unfortunately, did show that the ball had carried and it was a fair catch, so we should have given the batter out. We made a mistake. We admitted to it. Uh, the batter went on to score a big 100, so it was a tough day at the office for us. Uh, but um, that unfortunately does happen. We all make mistakes. Uh, what's important is that we learn from our mistake. And um, I now instead of moving to my left to try and see a uh, slip fielder catching the ball, um, a right arm over the wicket bowler usually veers off to the left when following through after his or her delivery. So because I went that way to try and view the catch, he then obstructed my view. If I had gone this way to my right, then I would have easily been able to see the ball carry into the fielder's hands. So uh, mistake made, but lesson learned that day on how to better view a catch in the slip cordon uh, without being obstructed by the follow through of the bowler. Can an appeal be withdrawn. Let's see what the law says. The law tells us that the captain of the fielding side may withdraw an appeal only after obtaining the consent of the umpire within whose jurisdiction the appeal falls. If such consent is given, the umpire concerned shall, if applicable, revoke the decision and recall the batter. We have a video of a very famous incident that will show this in action. Let's learn a little bit more about the withdrawal of the appeal before we see one in action. The withdrawal of an appeal must be before the instant when the ball comes into play for the next delivery or if the innings has been completed, the instant when the umpires leave the field. So very famous incident. England against India, probably about 10 years ago now. Let's see what happened in this match. Putting on 162 for the third wicket. Then in the final ball of the session, incredible controversy. Owen Morgan thought he'd scored four here after some clumsy fielding by Pravan Kumar. And the batsman began walking off the tee. Replay showed, though, the ball never actually touched the rope. So when the bales came off with Morgan and Bell on their way back to the pavilion, India appealed, perhaps unsportingly, to the unlikeliest run out you will ever see. And the letter of the law said Bell had to go. And the 
dramatic and savoury end it seemed to a brilliant innings of 137 Bell bemused the crowd furious with England 254 for four where the second session had ended in booze and acrimony and the England batsman walked back onto the field after tea it was to astonish stares and then huge cheers to see Ian Bell amongst them during the interval, Indian captain MS Dhoni had sportingly withdrawn their successful appeal over Bell's controversial run-out. A big call in every sense. The spirit of the game prevailing over the letter of the law. Putting the spirit of the game prevailing over the letter of the law. Uh, I want to note there that the withdrawal of that appeal came after the tea break. And of course, the dismissal was before the tea break. Um, and earlier, I showed you that we shouldn't withdraw an appeal uh, after we've called time, which the umpires wouldn't would have called time at that dismissal over time and tea. Um, however, as the commentator said, the spirit of the game. Uh, overruled, in a way, uh, the letter of the law in that particular incident. Always try as far as possible not to force a captain to withdraw a controversial appeal, but suggest to a captain to withdraw a controversial appeal. So, that is me for this evening. Uh, let us now take uh, questions from the floor and we will also be going back to those two scenarios that we posted during the presentation. Um, there was a hand up, but it went down. So I'm going to check the meeting room to see if Langton is with us. It does not seem that Langton is with us today, um, so he won't be taking us through those. Oh, Langton is here. Uh, Langton, uh, please yeah. unmute your microphone. Thank you. Um, great to have you with us once again. I am going to uh, put up those two scenarios that I um, went through earlier in my presentation about the wicket being put down and if you can maybe give us your expert opinion on whether or not uh, the wicket has been fairly put down in these two scenarios so let us start with the video that went viral during COVID and Let's get your verdict before we check the chat box to see everybody else's verdict. I'm just going through all my slides again to get to the correct uh, video, and then we shall get Langton to talk through it. So, Langton, I am putting on the slideshow and sharing my screen. And I'll play it once more for us, and then uh, you can talk us through the video, please. Oh, ball. Good appeal from deep cover from Freddy. Well, amazing. Uh, the bale is uh, dislodged onto the top of the stumps. Umpires have a little chat and uh, decide it's not out. So Langton, first scenario for us, you are the bowlers and umpire. Uh, that decision is in your jurisdiction to make. 
uh, out or not out, sir, and why or why not? Langton, please unmute your microphone if you are still with us. Hi, Tom. Hi, Abdullah. I hope you guys enjoy the conference and good evening, everyone. Um, I would not want that happening because there's a bit of controversy with that. But if we go to the laws, the laws tell us that if a bail is completely removed from the top of the stumps, and in this case, it's not completely removed. And also the laws tell us about a bail being disturbed. So this one's been disturbed. It's still on top of the stumps. Unfortunately, it didn't fall to the ground or wasn't on its way down when it suddenly stopped. So it's still on top of the stumps. It was disturbed for a little bit, but it stayed on top of the stumps. Whether it's in its correct position or not, the laws don't talk about that because that bail is still on top of the stumps. We will regard it as not being out. Well, that's what I would do. 100% Langton, I fully agree with you. And I saw Abdullah was nodding his head as well. So um, I think the, the, the floor here is um, convinced. Thank you. So that's uh, that's the first scenario. Let's go on to the second scenario. And let's assume that same ball was delivered and that same bell was uh, naughty again. Uh, but this time it's landed between the two stumps. Uh, off stump and uh, middle stump, or in this occasion, I think we had a left-hand bat, so that would be uh, leg stump and middle stump. Uh, is the wicket broken? Is the batter out? Or is the wicket not broken? Is the batter not out? Please, Langton. You're on mute again there, Langton. In this case, because the bail is not on top of the stumps, it's lodged somewhere between the two stumps. It is not on top anymore. This would be out. 100% fully agree there. And uh, our law guru, Abdullah, also giving his uh, nod of approval. Thank you very much, Langton. Uh, we'll keep you close by. I, I see a couple of hands up. Uh, our uh, regular uh, customers are in line, uh, but top of the list, uh, Christopher Felix, uh, please unmute your microphone and the floor is yours. Good evening, Tom. Uh, I've got two questions. Uh, may I ask both, please? Uh, because there are very few hands up, uh, yes, you may ask both, Christopher. Okay. Uh, I will ask the first one if you if you can perhaps then respond and then I'll do the second one. So the sure. first question, if the bales have been removed because it's windy. Mm. So in the previous law, we discussed that. And uh, I think it was Abdullah that presented and said the ball can then simply kiss the stumps and it will be given out. So my question in then that same instance in the case of a run out. Is it then necessary to then remove the stump with the ball in hand, or can it just hit the wickets if the bales was removed because of the wind? Abdullah, you've got a masterclass on YouTube for us on that. Um, can you summarize it for us? And uh, while I go and look for the link and post it in the chat box, uh, you can uh, answer Christopher's first question, please. Uh, good evening, Chris, and good evening, everyone. Uh, Chris, to answer your question, uh, yes. So let me summarize how the law works when you decide to remove the bells from both ends, uh, let's say due to uh, wind, or 99% of the time it is because of wind that you decide to remove the bells, and then you need to remove the bells from both sides. So to confirm, because of wind, umpires decide to remove the bells from both sides. So now, how do you put the wicket down? Or how is the wicket put down? In terms of bowl, all now that needs to happen is the ball just needs to touch the stumps, literally kiss the stumps. If there's contact made between ball and the stumps, the wicket is put down. So an example of bowl, it just needs to kiss the stumps for um, the bowl 
dismissal to be effective. So yes, it is difficult. That's why delay uh, delay the decision to play without belts because if you do decide to play without belts, uh, it just makes your life so much difficult because you just need to judge whether it kissed or not. So that is bold. Now, Chris, the same principle applies to when when it's um, for a run out. So all that needs to happen is the ball just needs to kiss the stumps for the run out dismissal to be uh, affected. That is one of the methods to rem uh, to put the wicket down once you remove the bells from both ends due to eye win. So it just needs to kiss the, the wickets. Another method to put the bell down, to put the wicket down is to throw the ball so hard that you remove the stump out of the ground. Another way of putting the wicket down is to uh, take uh, the, the ball in your hand, lift one of the stumps out. That is a method to put, not necessarily, all it needs to do is touch, but I'm just saying a lot of players don't know this law, but that, that is another method of putting uh, the wicket down. But just bottom line, no bells, was removed due to win. It just needs to touch the stumps to, to get a bowl decision or a run out decision. Thank you. Over thank to you, you Tom. Much. That's your first question. Yeah, your next one, Chris. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, now it was just uh, uh, some curiosity that, that uh, came in because I remember on a previous lecture you did explain that it simply need to touch mm. if it was removed yeah. during, uh, because of wind. Mm, yeah, eagle eyes, you need to be uh, focused, you know, concentrate much more when there are no bells, uh, bells on. Um, uh, but yeah, as I said, try to delay removing the bells for as long as you as you can. Um, okay, thank you. Over, Tom. Thanks, Chris. Over to you, Tom. Thanks, Dilak. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Okay, then the second question. If the, uh, if the fielder in... Uh, attempting a single uh, as he runs and approach the popping crease and he dives to try and save his wicket. On the initial dive, he lands the bat and it is behind the line. But as he falls, elbow hits the ground, uh, hand is elevated, bat is elevated. During that time, the the wickets get this, uh, the bales get dislodged. Would that be given out or not out? Abdullah, you want to take us through that one as well, please? Uh, uh, yes, Tom. So, Chris, the uh, either the batter gets immunity from being uh, run out if in diving or uh, forward running. So, those are the two things. The the either batter either needs to dive towards the uh, um, the wicket to make his or her ground or the fielder by running towards uh, th that in and the forward momentum after putting the bat down and again important the bat must be by either diving or running being grounded or behind the popping crease and then the subsequent loss of contact between bat and ground so let's say in diving in your scenario the field the batter was diving so the, the, the batter dived uh, planted the bat behind the popping crease, i.e. made his or her ground. Then there was subsequent loss, so then the bat popped up. And while the bat then popped up, then the wicket was put down. In this case, batter will get immunity from being run out. Batter will not be given run out. But the conditions that needs to be met, batter needs to dive towards uh, the stumps or running towards uh, the stumps. And batter must have made the ground. So the bat must have been put uh, a portion of the bat behind the popping crease. And then subsequent contact was lost with the ground and the wicket was put down. So those are the three conditions that must be met for the runner, for the, uh, either batter to get immunity from being run out. Did I Thank answer you your, question, uh, your question, Chris? Yes, 100%. Thank you so much. OK, uh, over to you, Tom. Awesome. Thanks, Abdullah. Um, 
next we have our Tom Smith specialist. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Tom Smith is a renowned cricket law interpreter. He's written numerous books over the years, uh, which a lot of umpires still refer to, to try and get a better understanding of the laws. Uh, what I would like to make clear is that um, we as um, professional umpires, we use the ICC, the International Cricket Council Almanac, which is a guideline as to how to interpret the playing conditions of different ICC tournaments. So sometimes there is a difference in interpretation of the law by Tom Smith versus the ICC Almanacs. And uh, Mohammed, I hope you know that we focus more on the Almanac than we do on Tom Smith. So if there are any discrep discrepancies, we're not here to debate uh, between Tom Smith and the Almanacs. Uh, but having said that, you are welcome to unmute your microphone and talk us through your question this evening. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, class, good evening. I um, just want to clear up this this point here with the potter leave his, his crease, so to speak, on the misapprehension. Now, when he leave, leave his crease on the misapprehension, that, like you said, a call of a no ball, unfortunately, he, he or she did not hear the call, keep on walking. However, before the umpire signal, you know, called that ball, the ball was still alive. The field, uh, like short, you know, the field was feeling short next to the uh, to the um, to the other umpire, the striker, then umpire, then run, run him, run he or she out. Um, that would be the controversial, like you said, but um, but law teaching us, teach us, uh, he or she is out. You could get run out with a no ball. Uh, I have two more questions when they get back to me. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I'm coming to Tom Smith, what you said. I'm not really um, fond of the Tom Smith. I'm going to go by you and just leave it like that. Okay. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, great to engage with you uh, as usual. Uh, Langton, you want to take that one for us? Uh, I, I spoke through it, but I, I, I wasn't committal in terms of whether I'm going to give the guy out or not, if um, the short leg fielder has run out the batter who has left the crease under the misapprehension that he or she was bowled, but it was a no ball. So he or she cannot be out no ball, but of course you can be run out off a no ball. So Langton, what uh, do we do in that situation as umpires? Mohammed, if we go to law 20, I think it is dead ball, it talks about when the ball becomes dead. And once an umpire signals dead ball, it doesn't become dead right then. It can go back. Let's say something happened when the ball was delivered. It can go back to as far as when that ball was delivered and not when a batter was dismissed. So dead ball covers the instant when you thought something happened that was outside the norm. So in this case, even, even though the guy was run out, the dead ball law would apply to when you thought they left their crease under the misapprehension that they were out. So it goes further back and we don't go just to when the batter is dismissed. It takes it a little bit back. I don't know if that answers your question or not. No, I, I, I respect what you say, Mr. Lantern, but um, like, um, like I said, um, no, the question is, if this could happen, the answer is yes. He or she continue walking. The question remains misapprehension. So, I mean, again, the feeling side have a right, you know, to run out because the captain of the feeling side know he or she could out with a um, run out with a no ball, so to speak. Thank you. Right. right. So, because the fielding side regards the ball as being live, the batter did not think that. The ball was live because they didn't hear the call or see the umpire signaling no ball. 
you as the umpire will then intervene in this case, and your call of dead ball negates the run out. It goes back to when the batter left their crease for the catch in this case, maybe, or bold in this case. So that would go back to that instant. So that run out would not then take effect because the ball was deemed dead from the moment when this batter thought they were out because the umpire intervened. Even though the call of dead ball came late, we rewind to the moment where we felt dead ball applied. And that's what the law said. Okay, so in this situation, your umpire have all right to call back the batter. Am I right? Yes, in this case, the batter okay. would not be out, run out. Not be out. Okay, thank you. I have two more questions when they get to my turn. Okay, thanks, Mohammed. We will take uh, further questions from the hands that are up, and then we'll come back to you when we're done with them. Pankaj, you've got your hand up. Please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Okay, so good evening to everyone. Uh, my question is very easy. It's regarding substitution. So let's say when injured player is ready to take place the field and he informs umpire about it. So when umpire shall allow that exchange, is it between the overs or it can happen during the over? Abdullah, you want to take that one? When is a fielder allowed to return onto the field? Uh, Pankaj, thanks for your question. As soon as there is a moment, Pankaj, that you can allow the fielder back, you then can indicate to the fielder that he or she can return. Does not necessarily have to be at the end of the over. Uh, example, let's say there's, there's uh, um, on the third ball of the over, uh, there's an injury to, to the batter of one of the, or the fielders and uh, the physios uh, running out onto the field. There's a, br a, br uh, a break in play. That's an ideal moment to allow the injured fielder to come, to come back on. That's just one example, but to answer your question, you do not have to wait till the end of the over. If there is a moment that you can allow the, the, the injured player to come back on, uh, you can do it. But if nothing happens, um, and you can then just let the over, uh, bowler complete the over, and then allow the fielder to come back at the end of the over. Oh, and may another example, let's say a wicket falls mid-over. Another great opportunity to allow the injured fielder to come back on. Uh, did I answer your question, Pankaj? Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, over, Tom. Thanks, Dula. Next hand up, Reginald Bodo Berry, the Mayor of East London. Good evening, sir. Please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Hello, Tom. Hi, Raji. How are you? I'm here. Good, thanks. Uh, your signal's not that great, but please uh, try go ahead. Let's hear if we can listen to your question. Okay, I've got a question. Um, uh, in a game on Saturday I was doing, um, <clears throat> bowler runs into bowl to the batter and then oversteps. Um, um, a call of no ball was made. A bowler hits the stumps. The ball ricochets down to third man. And batters start to run and then it goes for four. Please explain the signals as in as in order of the event. Uh, sure, no problem, Reggie. I'm going to give that one to Langton. If you can just um, replay the scenario for us again so we know exactly what to signal. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the bowler bowls and then he oversteps. Uh, a call of no ball was made. Batsman at the strikers end gets bowled. Um, batsman, the ball ricochets down to third man. Batsmen start to run, and ball goes for four. Okay. Explain the, uh, the signals as in the order of the events taking place. 
Okay, and... I just uh, want to see if I got it right. Okay, Reggie, just for clarification, there was no inside edge or the ball didn't ricochet off the no. off the pads. It went. It was a clean, clean ball. No, it was straight onto the stumps, straight down to third man boundary. Okay, awesome. Langton, please oh, take us through. Right. Fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know. I had the same sort of scenario in a schools game on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Only difference is my case was it was off a free hit and not the no ball itself. Ball went for four off the free hit. So what would happen in your case, you signal the no ball, you signal buys, then four. In my case, because it was off the free hit, free. I just had to signal four buys, then free hit, yes. Okay, now... I, I done it in that way. I just wanted to get clarity. Yeah, and that is the correct way to do it. Awesome. Thank you, Landon. Awesome, Thanks, Bodo. Keep, keep up the Akula. great standards there in uh, border cricket. You're doing a great job, mate. Keep going. <laughs> Thanks, I. Cheers, Dula. Uh, hello, great to hear from you again, uh, Bodo. Have a good evening. Thank you, sir. <laughs> right, uh, Mohammed. Um, I saw that Mazizi's hand was up for a brief moment. Uh, I think he wanted to greet uh, Reggie Bodo Barry, but uh, his hand is down now. So the floor is yours, Mohammed. Uh, you can unmute your microphone and we can go through your two other questions. Please uh, unmute yeah. your. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, the slide what you shows before with uh, Ridley Ridley Jacob when he get run out. I mean when he get bowled, right? However, if the the keeper hand, you no, know, is showing. This is world televised. Everybody saw it. Uh, deliberate. Well, I wouldn't say deliberate. Front of the stumps, and um, he get bowled. The question remains that. I don't know what, uh, Mr. Lantern, what the third umpire do in this situation and how come the batting, the batting side captain did not uh, withdraw the appeal in that scenario, the one we just learned. The batting captain cannot withdraw an appeal. It's the fielding captain. captain. That... No, no, with Ridley Jacob, when, he, when the guy illegal, you know, the keeper have his gloves in front of the wicket. The, the slide where you show us. Wicket yeah. keeper position. Last we 27. Can, yeah, we can watch that video again. Um, but well, before we watch Why it... Why the bat inside captain cannot re, uh, withdraw an appeal? He has a right, he or she. Because uh, it's a televised match. It is not the batting captain or the batting team that appeals, Mohammed. it's the fielding side that appeals. Yeah, but the question remains, he purposely have his gloves in front of the wicket, according to the slide. That's where, that's where I learned the question from. Okay, what let's watch, come up? Uh -huh. let, go ahead. Let's watch the video again, and then um, we can discuss it afterwards, okay? I'm going to put the video on for us. Hello guys, welcome to my channel. First, let's watch a footage from the T20 match between India and Australia, which happened on 21st of November 2018. Australian wicketkeeper Alex Carey ends up touching the stumps before the ball reaches him and after referring to the third umpire, it was declared a no ball. So what do you guys think about it? It's a no ball because he touched the stumps? Well, let's find out. Before going any further, let us take a look at the restrictions a wicketkeeper has. He has restrictions both on his movement and position. According to cricket law, after the ball comes into play, well, to know when the ball comes into play, watch the above video. And before the ball reaches the striker, 
it is unfair if the wicket keeper makes any significant movement in this case umpire will call it dead ball and further action will be invalid however he is allowed to make certain movements let's take a look at them he is allowed to move a few steps forward for a slower delivery but doing so should not bring the stumps in his reach he is allowed to move laterally like this wicket keeper in response to the direction in which the ball has been delivered he is allowed to move in response to the stroke that the striker is playing like this wicket keeper does but he has to make sure that he follows the law 27.3.1 let's see what exactly that law is the wicket keeper shall remain wholly behind the wicket he can't even be parallel to the stumps from the moment the ball comes into play till either of the following things happens ball touches the bat or body of the striker so he can come ahead of the stumps right after the ball touches the bat or batsman's body just like this keeper does next case he can come ahead after the ball passes the stumps and he can come ahead if the striker starts running without playing the shot it will be called a no ball in case of keeper violating this law in the case of alex carey ball had touched the bat when he broke the wicket hence this is not a violation of law but he was parallel to the stumps before the ball made contact with the bat hence it was called a no ball another instance which needs a mention here is andy flars incident he is clearly ahead of the stumps even before the ball reached the batsman it should have been called a no ball but the umpire didn't notice it at all and unfortunately it costed ridley jacobs his wicket That's still have any do, do let me know right. if you like the video hit the like button share with all your friends to never miss another it costed ridley jacobs his wicket still have any and unfortunately it costed okay so mohammed Yes. We are pulling the whole that slide. That is uh-huh. illegal feeling. The wicket keeper not wholly behind the stumps. And that's one. Secondly, his movement. Look at the wicket keeper. That's you know why how the feeling is like captain would be draw a field. That's my question. Because Abdullah you he glad the guy out and the umpire did not call no ball. He did not, you know, uh I don't know if anything happened for the for this in this situation. Abdullah you want to take us through this scenario what actually happened and what should have happened please uh, Muhammad let me first just confirm what the law is saying from the moment the ball comes into play the keeper is not allowed to have his hands in front of the stumps unless the batter attempts a run or touches the bat or person of the striker in this case it didn't so with the keeper's hands in front of the stumps the striker's in umpire needs to call and signal no ball i'm not sure if this was sent uh, upstairs or uh, or not let's assume it was not up, uh, I'll, i'll cover both scenarios if it wasn't sent up upstairs so this is definitely a clear instance of batter being dismissed uh, yet wicket now if it wasn't sent upstairs for the tv umpire to have a look The strikers in umpire missed this. The strikers, strikers in umpire did not see that the keeper um, had his hands. Andy Flower had his hands in front of the stumps before he, uh, the bat. It either touched the bat or person of the striker. If the if it was sent upstairs to the TV umpire, again the TV umpire didn't pick up that. and the flower had his hands in front of the stumps because if they did pick it up as per the laws of cricket this should have been called no ball hence ridley jacobs should not have been given out because you cannot be dismissed uh, hit wicket of a no ball in terms of the fielding side withdrawing uh, the appeal yes the law allows the captain of the fielding side to uh, to withdraw uh, the uh, the appeal in this case the fielding side uh, didn't um, uh, i'm not sure whether they were aware that the keeper's hands were in uh, front of the the stumps uh, so uh, and it looks like umpires didn't pick it up um tv umpire didn't pick it up if it was sent up upstairs to have a look 
Yeah, no one picked it up. So according to everyone that was on the field, this was a fairly straightforward dismissal of of it wicket. Uh, over, Tom. Thanks, Abdullah. Uh, Mohammed, I hope that answers your second question. Uh, on to your third question, please. Um, yeah, yeah. But the second question is a few things occurred there, um, uh, Mr. Lantern. Uh, is illegal movement by the wicket keeper, and that should be considered by the umpires as illegal feeling as well, plus the no ball. So I don't know if they take it further in that situation or not. Because that this is a televised match, you could see it. Everybody could see what's going on. Mohammed Abdullah has addressed your second question. Please ask your next question. I just want to be clear on that. Yeah, the next question is um, last twenty-four. No penalty time for a player leave the field for wholly acceptable reason. Uh, that could be complication. When you say wholly acceptable reason such as like what would be considered as wholly acceptable abdullah you gave us a good example you want to repeat that example for muhammad muhammad an example of a wholly acceptable reason in south africa's uh, provincial competition the cricket south africa provincial four-day competition we have many university students that play uh, plays for the various uh, teams. What often uh, happens is on a Saturday morning, uh, those some of those students write exams. So what what happens is they will inform us before the game start of the exam on the Saturday morning from nine uh, till eleven, and let's say they usually gets to the field about uh, twelve o'clock. So before the game starts. Um, they will inform us. We'll get a letter in writing from uh, from the uh, from the team and the university informing us of this exam. Within a way of it, so on Saturday morning when the game starts at ten, the um, the student only uh, or this fielder only arrives at the field at twelve o'clock. So for two hours, the fielder was not on the field of play. No penalty time needs to be incurred by that particular fielder because, yes, the fielder was off for two, for two hours, but the, uh, it was a wholly acceptable reason why the fielder was not at the ground, why the fielder was not on the field of play. So we will allow that fielder, upon uh, getting to the ground, upon uh, entering uh, or coming back onto the field, to bowl or bat immediately. So that is just a, one example of a wholly acceptable reason why this particular player does not have to incur any penalty time. Over, Tom. Thanks, Abdullah. Very thorough answer. Uh, next hand up, Christopher Felix. You may unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Uh, good evening, Tom. Uh, once again, just uh, an another question, uh, something with regard to uh, the following scenario. So the bowler uh, runs in, oversteps, the umpire calls front foot no ball. The batsman plays the ball, hits it towards deep square, who in attempting to catch the ball drops it. The batsman cross for a second run. The fielder who drops the ball then attempts the run out in throwing the ball to the wicket keeper's end. The throw is way off. It hits the helmet, uh, helmet of the wicket keeper that was previously removed, and the ball goes for four. What would be uh, the decision from the umpire in terms of the signals, the runs, and the outcome of that particular delivery? Uh, it sounds like an exam question you're trying to answer, you're trying to get us to answer for you, Alex. Uh, uh, sorry, Christopher, no problem. Uh, we're here to help. Uh, Langton, you want to take us through that one? Uh, quite a fair bit going on. Would you like uh, Christopher to repeat the scenario? No, I heard, I heard it. Right. Uh, I feel like I'm in an exam right now, actually. 
So Christopher, <laughs> a no ball would definitely count. The runs completed would definitely count. The run in progress, if the batters had crossed, would definitely count. The ball would become dead the minute it hits the helmet. So the boundary would not count. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Langton. So in that instance, if they've crossed for two runs with the one run penalty for the no ball, and then five penalty runs for the ball hitting the helmet, would that be the runs allocated? They would get the runs for which they crossed and completed and all completed. In this case, those two, they would get the no ball, they would get the five penalty. So three, what, two runs scored off the bat and five run penalties and the no ball. And the next ball would be a free hit. I'm assuming this is a limited overs match. Yes, thank you very much. Yes. Great stuff. Thanks, Langton. And thanks for the question, Christopher. Next hand up, Pratish. Please unmute your microphone. Floor is yours. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, giving us empowerment. Uh, uh, just wanted to, sorry, maybe not with the last, which was covered today, but uh, related to innings and results, la last week, Tom, you showed us a video regarding a uh, test match, which got uh, the way the scores were level, and we said the result was mentioned as match drawn. I just wanted to ask a question on that. Um, yes, we say that innings is completed when the side is all out and uh, for the balls remains, but no for the batsman. At the fall of a wicket or a retirement of the batsman, there will no for the batsman to come in, whereas the balls still remain to be bowled. And uh, also declaration for feature will come into play. The last one in that uh, innings completion scenario was if there is a prescribed number of overs have been bowled as per the agreement which has been made before or the prescribed time has expired or, or, or reached. Mm. So in that particular test match, won't that uh, the last two lines like uh, prescribed number of overs, which is for the last hour at that time, it could have been 15 overs, I, I believe. And now it has changed to 20 overs in the last hour. Uh, and, and the time also was specifically mentioned, right? Maybe, uh, I don't know where it was played. Is it in Zimbabwe? Yeah, yeah Bulwayo. Bulwayo. So it should be, say, four to five is the last hour. So both conditions have been met, right? So prescribed number of overs is last hour's number of overs and time as well. So even then, uh, are we not com considering that innings as a completed innings? A uh, very good question, Pratish, and uh, good reference to the law. Um, however, that is now the end of the match. The prescribed number of overs and the prescribed time has been reached for the end of the match. But you will know that in a test match, there is no prescribed number of overs for an innings. OK, so there's a prescribed number of overs in a day which will complete the day. And if we have completed the fifth day of a test match, then the match is over. But the innings in the fourth innings of a match or, or whatever innings of the match it might have been, that innings is not completed uh, because of time or overs. There is no prescribed amount of time or no prescribed amount for the of innings. overs for an innings. Okay, agreed. Yeah. I, I was expecting the same answer. I just wanted to hear it from you guys so that we feel confident. Uh, must I give you an opportunity to punkage and then ask my second question? Uh, you can ask your second question because uh, Pankaj has already given a question as well. So go go for it, Pratish. Actually, I forgot my second question. Let him go first. Okay. <laughs> so. No problem. Uh, Pankaj, you may unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thanks again. Uh, I have a question regarding the super over. I, I tried to read the ICC rules for super over. Uh, my question is, when the super over starts, does 
the bowling team gets to choose the end from which they from which end they want to ball or or it's like a continuation end where the last over of the second inning bowled good question pankaj uh, we do not go through the playing conditions of a um, super over in this course because it's not part of the laws but we are happy to answer your question uh, abdullah uh, you are the uh, super over specialist i'm sure you've done a few in your career uh, please answer pankaj's question for him uh, pankaj when it comes to the super over the fielding side can choose from which end they would like to bowl. That's that is the playing condition when it comes to super over. Fielding side chooses from which end they would like to bowl. Over, Tom. Uh, thanks. And in continuation to that, can umpire switch the end in super over? No, uh, no Pankaj. They need to stand at the ends, uh, at the same end that they started the game. Umpires are not allowed to switch ends. So it may happen that one umpire is the ballers and umpire for both the both the overs in Super Bowl. Uh, that's, that's, yeah, just how it works. It can happen, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Well, yeah, luck of the draw, if you get the bowlers in, if it was me, I would love the bowlers in. I like to be in the action, uh, you know, every single ball. So if that happens to me, I would say yes. Thank you so much. Thanks, Pankaj. Thanks, Abdullah. Uh, I see Langton's got his hand up. You want to comment on that, Langton, before we go back to Pratish? If it helps. So, yeah, what, what Abdullah said is spot on. You would do it that way what you need to understand with the super over is when you ball what changes is when you've got more than one super over for the next super over you played like a normal cricket match if the first super over was bored from abdullah's end the next super over would be bored from tom's end if in the case of a tie in that super over because it's like a match you would do exactly what you do in a match if you ball the first super over you can't ball the second super over because it's treated like what you do in a game. You can't bowl two consecutive overs. If that helps, Pankaj. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Langton. Great stuff. Thanks for that additional clause there, Langton. Uh, Pratish, have you no, read thanks, yes, yes. your previous question? Go yes, ahead. Yes, actually, actually, it's not a new question. This is the same question which was asked last week. Uh, the ball, the bat of the hand, the ball being delivered, being a legal ball, the bat, the ball, the bat was uh, not held in the hand, but it makes contact with the ball. The ball goes over the boundary. Uh, I, I guess we agreed on that. We will discuss with other people and come back with an answer for this. Maybe we can wait for the last lecture. Langton, have you received any feedback from the ICC or the MCC on that scenario? Uh, the feedback that I got is the same that I got last time when I said that we treat it as a dead ball because it is a dead ball. Mm. I think we were not decided, we were still undecided as to whether that ball counts as a legal delivery in the over or we need to re -bowl it. Do we have clarity on that point yet? On that point, they still haven't come back. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Landon. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, we'll, we'll try and come back to you if we get um, the information from the relevant parties. Sure. Right. Thanks. Much appreciated. You're welcome. Next hand up is Sentil. Sentil, I haven't heard from you tonight. Good evening. Please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. I have one general question only, not related to the loss. So when you are starting with the career, if you are giving a LBW or outs, so it is always very critical for them when you are starting a career as umpire. So other outs you will know very clearly if it is, for example, catch, 
it is nicked by the bat everything you can see out clearly but the lbw and how much percentage if you are sure you can give go for it and what kind of things you will follow that is from me all the umpires i from tom abdullah and nanton i want your opinion like what would be the good practice when you are starting the career langton body language very important when given an lbw decision out or not out and also the timing of that decision how quickly you give it uh, please can you give us some uh, field techniques as to how to give a lbw decision out or not out especially as a new umpire that is a very tough question because it's stuff that i don't have to think about anymore or at least not consciously but the things that i was taught when i started umpiring based on law is that i have to consider five things and i i made the letters l b w p h so the first thing is is it a legal delivery because of watch the front foot i know okay that's fine the next thing is is the bat first if there's no bat first it means first contact was with body or pad the next is did the ball pitch wicket to wicket or outside off stump the next thing the p if it's outside off stump is the batter playing a shot the last thing which is the h do i con- do i think that the ball was going to hit the stumps if yes i give it out if no then it's not out so all i think about now it's subconscious are those five letters l b w p h that is all i think about from a field craft point of view what you want to do is to make sure that your timing for appeals is almost how do i put this across almost uh synchronized with the appeal not not giving giving it straight away but looking like or making it seem as if you thought about the processes of a decision because if you give it too quickly uh, our business is perception based the perception would be you like giving people out if it's too slow the perception is you are swayed by an appeal and that fine balance will come with time but if you can think about those letters l b w p h it should help with making decisions for the most part uh langton i want to add one more point from that one i want to ask you like what was the good time how many seconds we can take or what would be your from your experience what would be the minimum time or maximum time you can take for the lbw decisions Uh, for me it goes down to how difficult i think the decision was if i think it's one that's worth me thinking about it for a little bit longer i i give it a bit more time if i think it's straightforward i don't give it away i don't give it straight away but i still act as if i'm thinking about it because like i said this is a perception game if people perceive us to be hasty with our decisions they will not think that we're good umpires but your body language is critical when making decisions and i would encourage so we spoke about law i can't remember what law it is i think 29 or something i don't know no 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 it's actually not 29 uh, appeals and tom spoke about how's that how's that how's that what you want to do if you're sure call not out straight away if you don't think it's out that way there's not that much more of people appealing excessively if you think it's out then you would have given it out what you don't want is people thinking that you're being swayed by either party to make a decision and there's no prescription of how many seconds you have to make it or have to make a decision in it's it's something that you gr- get with time it's not something that any of us here can say give it 2 seconds 3 seconds 5 seconds because it's it's your style as an umpire Thank you so much Langton for the brief explanation. Thank you because this one is very difficult for me to judge that is what I mean. <laughs> Thanks Langton. Thanks for the question. Uh quick follow up on that Langton. I think uh, Lungisani his signal probably went a little bit off. He is asking 
for you to repeat the abbreviation of LBWPH, uh, explaining what each letter means, please. L LBWPH, uh, a good umpire by the name, well, I think he was a good umpire, by the name of Kevin Barber taught me that many, many years ago, and I've been using it for years. L is, is the ball a legal delivery or not? If it's not a legal delivery, we stop that it can't be out LBW. Because if it's a no ball, it can't be out LBW. If it's not a no ball, we go on to the B, which is, is there bat first? If there's bat first, it can't be, it shouldn't be out LBW because there's bat. If it's not bat first, we then go to the W, which is, did it pitch wicket to wicket or outside off stump? Because if it pitches outside leg stump, even though we know it's going to hit the stumps, we can't give it out. So if it pitches wicket to wicket or on the off side of the wicket, then we consider the next thing. The P would not apply if it's wicket to wicket. It only applies if it's outside legs, uh, off stump, which is, was the batter playing a shot? So is the shot being played or not? If the batter's playing a shot and impact is outside off stump, we shouldn't be giving them out LBW. If there isn't a shot offered, we then go to the last thing, which is the H. Was the ball going to hit the stumps? Which is the most critical thing, I think. If, it, if we think it's going to hit the stumps, then we give it out. If we don't think so, we don't give it out. Awesome. Thanks, Langton. Lungisani, I hope that answered your question. Next hand up is Vessi. Please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Uh, good evening, Tom, Abdullah. Thanks for the job well done so far. Uh, just a question for Langton. Uh, as it is now in international cricket, where the umpires don't look down anymore, just straight to the batsman, uh, how did you, as an umpire, coming through the ranks, adapt to that, just watching the batsman? Because how umpires on the club level must look most for the front foot no ball, but the third umpire is looking for the for the no balls. How did you uh, currently with that with the third third umpire doing the no balls? No, uh, that's all, Tom. Thanks. Uh, we see. I think if you don't look down, you will have issues. And part of why you want to look down and not just look at where the batter is, is so you know the angle that the bowler is bowling from. Because if you don't look down, you're not going to have the full picture. You'll know, oh my goodness, batter is hit in line, but maybe it might have been sliding down because the bowler is coming from an angle. So I still look down, not to see the front foot, but to sort of gauge the angle from which the bowler is bowling from. Are they close to the stumps? Are they wide of the stumps? I still look down. Some guys don't, and that might be why some people have issues with LBWs more than most decisions. I, I try uh, okay. to look down. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you, Langton. And strong with the career forward. Thanks for the question, Vesi. Next hand up, uh, Najwa Omar. Please unmute your microphone. Welcome. I think you've missed a few lectures because I didn't send you the links. Uh, yes, thank, thanks for that. Thanks for that, Tom. <laughs> but I'm here. Evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to find out by length and hours. Was, um, so some of the questions were posed already um, that I got clarity on. Um, but I want to, well, I'm just a bit curious on Langton, how he experienced his week without um, the third umpire. Um, his match that he was umpiring this week. Mm -hmm. Club match. Langton, when yeah. was the last time you did a club match? <laughs> uh, thanks for that question, Tom and Najwa. Um, what happened actually was this weekend, uh, I told you guys after the last call that I had a club game. Mm -hmm. I then mm -hmm. had three school games. And then I had a club game on Sunday. And when you go back to basics, it's probably tough. And I had a really close run out. What I've told myself when I'm umpiring with any decision, whether there's TV or not, I probably don't think too much about it when there's TV. 
But in a non-televised game, what I do, I'm not saying anyone else should do it. What I do when I'm standing at square leg for stumpings and runouts is make sure that if, if it's a right-handed batter, my right leg is in line with the pop increase. And why I do that is if I don't sort of see the batter or the bat be, um, past my right leg, I know it's out run out because there's no part of that battle person grounded behind the line. And if it's a left hander, I do it with my left foot. So if I if I don't see the bat grounded or the person of the batter grounded past my leg, I know they're out. I don't do that in a televised game because I can't stand in line with the pop increase. So it's something that I then think about. And I know what I do with, with um, club games and school games is the one constant that I know to be there with a decision like a run out is the pop increase. So that's where my focus is. The pop yeah. increase is the one thing that's not going to move. The ball is moving, the bat is moving. So I make it a point to focus on the line. Okay. I don't know and if that helped you in No, all good. I just wanted to know your experience, which means that I must get out of the pavilion and sit on um, on the outfield in line with the wicket if I'm not going to umpire as a spectator. So I'm nearly doing the course because my son plays cricket and I'm trying to understand the rules of the game um, because I've been with him through his career in cricket. I would encourage you to be an umpire. There are a lot of opportunities for female umpires right now. I think everybody will be out there. What, eh? <laughs> what, what, what they're trying to do now for any females that are on this call is mm -hmm. they're trying to match the same panel as they have for men's. So they're going to have an elite panel of umpires for women and an okay. international panel. And they're trying to do that by 2025. What they want to do is have their 40, 58 international panel umpires and 12 elite panel umpires. Those are the same numbers that they want for women's cricket. And they're slowly getting there. If you watched, if you watched the women's T20 World Cup, there were no male umpires. It mm. was just female umpires. Actually, female match officials, refs included. So you, it, you might want to think about umpiring because there are a lot of opportunities there. Okay, so Abdullah can't be a spectator anymore. Eh? I'm going to stand next to you. <laughs> Thank you. Evening all. Nazra, you've taken the big step of attending this course and you can't go wrong with uh, Abdullah teaching you all the laws. So please, uh, we don't want to see you in the stands. We want to see you uh, on the ground at striker's end. Abdullah will be at bowler's end and he will help you through your debut um, when the season starts in October. There you go. There's an offer for you. Uh, please take it because we, we want to make international umpires of especially females going forward. Patish, your hand is Tom up again. Below, what I'll try to uh, do, yes. Sorry, go ahead, Langton. What I'll try to do is uh, I'll send the document that the ICC prepared for the cricket operations, ICC cricket operations department that mm. talks about the numbers that they're targeting in the next three years. Great stuff, Langton. Um, either uh, you or myself can present uh, a little bit of that uh, document on um, Thursday or even our last lecture next, next week, Tuesday. Um, that would be awesome to make our candidates aware of the opportunities that are available, especially to female umpires going forward. Pratish, you had your hand up. It's back down. I'm, I'm not sure. It went down automatically. I don't know. Okay. Go ahead. I, I, anyway, I had an opportunity. Let Mazizi ask his question and then I'll ask again. Uh, no, you go ahead. I, I, I think we want to finish with Mazizi this evening because uh, okay. I, I know he's got a lot a lot on his mind. So uh, please okay. go ahead, Pratish. Okay, <laughs> sure. Uh, see, uh, since we discuss about fieldings and illegal fieldings, all those kind of stuff, I wanted to give two scenarios. I will, while I explain the scenario, I'll give the answer from my side. I just wanted to validate it across sure. you guys. Uh, one is uh, a, a fielder willfully takes his cap out 
the, the cap is in the air, the ball comes in contact with that cap, and then he catches the ball before the ball grounds in the, I mean, before the ball lands in the ground. That is illegal feeding for me, and it's five penalty runs, all those kind of scenario. And even after the ball, sorry, cap landed on the ground and the ball lands on the cap, it is the same for me. And the other scenario is accidentally the cap or the helmet falls down. The cap or helmet is in the air and the ball rebounds off the, off the helmet or the cap while it is in the air. And before the ball lands on the ground, the fielder takes the catch. That is out for me. Caught. And if, the flip side, if the cap or the helmet falls down in the ground and then the ball goes and rebounds from that helmet or the let's use the example helmet it rebounds from that helmet and the uh, fielder catches it that's not out for me thank you yeah correct uh, pratish i think that last one is a little bit more complicated than the other two uh, but because the helmet is on the ground even though the ball does not touch the ground itself, yeah. it touches the helmet that is on the ground, discarded or, or, or has fall, fallen off accidentally. It's not going to be a dead ball. It's not going to be five penalty runs because the helmet fell off accidentally. accidentally. But it cannot be out caught because the helmet is in contact with the ground. Uh, Abdullah? Uh, please uh, verify my thinking or advise us otherwise. <clears throat> yeah, I have a different interpretation, uh, uh, Tom. Mm. Yeah, if it fell off accidentally mm. and on the ground and it's the helmet, ball doesn't touch the ground and then ricochets and gets taken before cleanly by a field before touching the ground. In that case, um, I would give the batter out uh, court. In instances where, let's say, short leg fielder has the helmet, um, at, uh, has got a helmet on, uh, batter pulls the ball, the ball lodges in the helmet, and then the force takes the helmet off the fielder's head, and it now lands on the floor. In that instance, with the ball still lodged in the in the helmet, uh, helmet on the floor, that would be deemed not out yet, uh, although the ball is still alive, but um, that would be deemed not out. So my interpretation uh, of Pankaj's um, scenario, Prati scenario, is I I would say that would that would be out. We have another expert on the li on the line, uh, Langton. What is your interpretation? My interpretation is the same as yours. If the ball knocks the helmet off and lodges in the helmet, it is not out court because the helmet's not worn anymore, but the ball is still alive, so you can be out, run out. And that's the only thing that I would add to it, that the run out still in play, but the catch can't be because the ball, the ball is, well, the ball is considered to be on the ground because the helmet fell off the person's head. That's the only thing that I'd add to it. And I agree with what you said. I have a twist to it, though. And this is not the helmet anymore. With the playing conditions now, if any equipment is discarded, so if, say, a wicked keeper puts a glove in their waistband or in their waist, as some keepers now do, Donny does that, and the ball hits that uh, glove that's been discarded, even though it's not on the ground, it's considered illegal fielding. Same thing applies with a short leg fielder. If they have a cap in the back of their trousers and they turn around, if someone say playing a sweep shot or a pull shot and the ball touches that cap that's not worn, it, it would be considered five penalty runs because it's been discarded willfully. Even though it's still on their person, it's not where it's supposed to be. So it would be considered five penalty runs. Thanks, Langton. I think you've answered um, Abdullah's scenario, but not Pratish's yeah. scenario. <laughs> so yeah. Pratish's scenario. Maybe, maybe Langdon has, is agreeing with uh, Abdullah. That's what I believe. Uh, but but I have yes, another question. Sorry, Tom, to cut you down. Uh, yeah. uh, 
in in the same case, if it's not the helmet, if it's a cap, will you give it out, uh, Abdullah? Even though it won't rebound from the cap. Accidental. Sorry, you are mute. I would apply the same principle. Accidentally, uh, very unlucky, but the ball did not make contact uh, with the ground. And and if it ricochets off and the and the fielder catches it, no, very it, unlucky to the batter. But I would I would still say a better out court. In this case, That's it my won't ricochet. Right? Sorry, Abdullah. In this case, it won't re ricochet, right? It's a cap. It's uh, it's going to go and land on the cap, which is in the ground. The the cap was uh, accidentally uh, fell down from the uh, head of the fielder, and the ball landed on the cap. And Within no no time, the fielder grabs the ball. Uh, no, in that's, that scenario, that's no, right? Yeah, in that scenario, no, 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 no. I thought it ricochets off. No, in that scenario, I would no, not out. Okay, yeah, not out. Yeah, it cannot lie on the cap, and then now you pick it up, and now you say, "How is it?" Um, I wouldn't give that out. Uh, where Lantern, has, where do you have a different it? same interpretation? Same interpretation. The cap is grounded. So the ball is yeah. then grounded because the cap is on the ground. Whereas the helmet is also grounded, but it ricochets from the helmet. That you will consider it as uh, out if the helmet was grounded accidentally. Yes, that's my interpretation. Any, let, let me, if you want, I could read what this is. And actually, I won't read it. I'll, I'll screenshot it, send it to Tom, then he will read it. Great. Thanks, Langton. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's interesting that we are treating the cap different to the helmet here because uh, what Pratish is saying is um, the helmet falls off accidentally from the fielder's head. The ball falls on the ball. Sorry, the ball falls on the helmet that is now on the ground and it bounces back up off the helmet and the fielder takes the catch. Are we saying that that is a fair catch? The helmet is on the ground. The ball bounces on the helmet. It doesn't bounce on the ground. It bounces on the helmet and the fielder completes right. the catch. So if the equipment is not worn, they won't benefit from the penalty runs. But because it is not worn, it is grounded and it's where it's not supposed to be, the mm. ball would be considered grounded in this case. But they won't get the penalty runs. What won't happen is that the batter will not be dismissed out court because this ball came in contact with something that's on the ground. That's, that's what yeah, I Because it Correct. fell off by accident. It fell off by accident. Um, the penalty runs will not be incurred, but the catch will not stand. Perfect. That's what I was also thinking. Uh, I just wanted to go back to Abdullah. If he. Because Abdullah, your interpretation, maybe may, there may, could be a reason for it. Uh, now that uh, looking at from Langton's uh, angle, I agree with Langton. Okay. Okay. Maybe I didn't explain the scenario correctly to you. That's why I, I mis uh, misled you. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry for that. Apologies. Thanks, Thanks Pratish. Um, next hand up, uh, Mazizi Gampu. You've had your hand up for a long while. Uh, so let's uh, give you the airtime that you deserve. My legend, please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Thank you, Tom. And only if you knew that I was quicker than uh, Pratish. I knew Pratish is, is one of our empires here. Yeah? The the questions that he asks, they make <laughs> you think a lot, eh? Um, he's, <laughs> but when you ask a question, you start thinking and you start like going back to the laws and you start like, yeah, Pratish, how do you come across such <laughs> such scenarios? But anyway, <laughs> it, it's a it's a good person to have around because you you start you start thinking. And it's actually a learning curve for all of us because, I mean, you never stop learning in this game. Um, well, mine was not a, a question as such, but just to add on what Langton was saying, and I was going to add to 
the Lady Empire and the opportunities that we had. Uh, lucky enough, I was one of the uh, liaising officers there for the World Cup. And as Lentin mentioned, that it was um, uh, mostly women that were there. And the other opportunity that might just arises, like maybe if you start empiring and then you become a match ref, you can be an empire coach as well because there was no empire coach. The only empire coach that we had there, those were male figures. So that's another opportunity that, that's opened up that, that could uh, be occupied by any of the ladies to, to add on to that. So my comment was around that. And um, uh, one other thing, Tom, uh, did we... Oh, sorry, man, I was just busy with, uh, with the kids and so forth. I, I'm not sure if we covered the, the player returning um, to the field and informing the empires with that. So I think if we did, one of the things, if I, I did miss out, I do apologize for that. But then in most cases, what, what I completely didn't understand with this, it's uh, player retaining. That means the original player that went off the field and coming back. And we, without that player informing either of the empires, that's when the, uh, the penalty is applicable. Not the, the one that subs or the one that's coming in for the player that, that goes out. So that's just one thing that I just wanted to make sure that uh, it has been clarified. Over. That's a good question, Abdullah. Uh, what if the nominated player goes off the field and we have a substitute that comes onto the field without the umpires knowing and then that substitute fielder comes into contact with the ball? Uh, do we treat him or her the same as a player returning without permission? Or because he's a new player, we uh, give him some leniency? Uh, uh, Tom, just to confirm, let's say John goes off for um, to have treatment. Mm. And then Peter comes onto the field, not John, and Peter touches the ball. We treat Peter exactly the same as we would treat John. It will be player returning without permission. Ball to become dead, far penalty runs, ball not to count. So exactly the same. Okay, so it is actually not just a player returning to the field without permission. It is a player joining the field at any point in time without the permission of the on-field umpires. Um, obviously, the first set of players to take the field will be assumed to have been granted permission when the match starts uh, or when any inning starts. Uh, it's just during an innings uh, when a substitute comes on or when a nominated player returns to the field that they need to have explicit permission from the umpires. Thank you, Dula. Next hand up, uh, Sentil, back again. Please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Uh, I want to ask only one question to the Pradesh question, what he asked regarding the cap. Uh, Langton is told that if this silly, silly point fielder, if he have a cap and backside of the trousers, if he hits, we need to give the penalty runs for five runs. What about if they have uh, some towels? What about what? Sorry. Please some repeat. small towels. Towels. They are keep some towels to clean the ball to remove the wet. So if they having a towel in backside of their trousers, if it, the ball hits the towel, whether we need to avoid a five penalty runs or it is acceptable. Langton, you want to right. take So with the towel, because we don't know where the towel is meant to be worn, you will not give penalty runs for that with a cap and gloves you know the gloves for the wicket keeper are supposed to be worn on the hands a cap is headwear so if it's not where it's supposed to be worn those two things you'd penalize them for and the towel we don't know where where it's supposed to be so it wouldn't it wouldn't be you wouldn't penalize anyone for that there's an interesting scenario that happened in a sri lanka versus i can't remember who they were playing i think it was last year where the short leg fielders 
had pads on. And as we know, short leg fielders, anyone else other than the wicket keeper, when they're wearing pads, they should not be worn externally. Mm. And a lot of Sri Lankan players, they had about three or four people that had pads on. And the ICC then made it mandatory mm. that if the pad becomes exposed and the ball comes off the exposed part of the pad, it would be treated as though it's discarded equipment because it shouldn't be exposed. Because they were doing it deliberately to make sure that the ball goes off the pad, ricochets, and is caught. And then the ICC decided if the pads are exposed and the ball comes off the exposed part, we will treat it like it's ex uh, it's equipment that's been discarded. Interesting. So this is... Uh pads which are under the pants but are protruding from between the the bottom of the pants and the top of the shoes am i right in saying correct, that yes. yes that is correct yes because well the reason why they did this was because of the intent the sri lankans were trying to cheat and then right. they said because of this we will then go this is exposed equipment which shouldn't be exposed penalty runs right i think if i remember correctly from what i've heard of that scenario i didn't see it they were uh, intentionally wearing pads which were thicker than the normal uh shin pads that sh uh, close in fielders used to wear and um you're right they were trying to have the ball bounce further off the pad than it normally would for normal thin shin pads, which are usually completely concealed by the pants. And that is correct. They were wearing batting pads. Awesome. Thank you for that insight, uh, Langton. Uh, very interesting how players always try and uh, cheat the system, but uh, there is an answer from the laws or the playing conditions that can catch them out. Right, so no longer do we have hands up. Uh, so we will go through the chat box. And uh, I see you've all uh, engaged in uh, the questions that I asked of you. Um, so scenario number one uh, was definitely not out as the bail landed back on top of the stumps uh, langton took us through that scenario number two the ball sorry the bale went down off the top of the bales off the top of the stumps in between the off stump and the middle stump three quarters of the way up so that was uh, out and then we had the gentleman who was standing with the bat resting on his hamstring uh, not holding the bat, so that was out. Before I go any further, I see a hand is up. Ken, please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Good, uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yes, Hello? there's a lot of background noise. Please switch off the television or the radio behind you, Ken. Thank you. Go ahead. Let me mute uh, mute the TV, please. I just want to confirm about the Thursday. What are we going to start? Is it going to the usual time or because today we have extended it a bit longer? Than the little day. Uh, Ken, uh, there's a lot of noise in the background. Please try and uh, stop that noise. Um, we we uh, always do do a bigger bugger. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Uh, you're on uh, babysitting duties, I understand. Okay, so we always start at 6 p.m. South African time. Uh, we uh, make sure that we finish presenting uh, an hour and a half or an hour and 45 minutes later, and then the question and answer session can go on forever because all of you are so interested in asking Langton questions. So there's no official end time to our lectures, but there is an official start time to our lectures. And if you need to log off, Ken, you can catch the recording of every lecture on our YouTube channel. I hope that answers your question.
Right, going back to the chat box. What else have we got here? Patience asks, in the video of where a fielder caught a batter with uh, his gloves, so that was uh, Baba Razam. It wasn't a catch of a batter. It was a catch of a throw by Rizwan. Um, if he had a glove on one hand, but caught the ball in the other hand, Abdullah, would we have given five penalty runs? And if that catch was straight off a batter's bat with the hand not wearing the glove, would that be out caught or would we punish him for using the wicketkeeper's glove even though he didn't take the catch with the wicketkeeper's glove? Uh, patience, great question. It is only illegal fielding if the ball makes contact with the keeper's gloves and that gloves are worn by uh, another fielder who is not the keeper. So in your scenario, because the ball did not make contact with the glove, so the glove was, let's say, in the left hand, the uh, fielder caught the ball in the right hand that does not have a glove on, that is not seen as illegal fielding. It needs to make contact with the glove that's on the hand, or let's say the left hand, and as soon as it makes contact with the glove on the left hand uh, of a fielder, uh, other than the wicketkeeper, that would be deemed illegal fielding, and then you'd go through the punishment by giving um, penalty runs, ball not to count, et cetera, et cetera. To answer your other question, Tom, with regards to uh, catching, let's say the glove was on the left hand, and the batter edged the ball, and the and the fielder, not the keeper, now fielder wearing a glove on the left, catching the ball with his uh, with uh, the right hand, that would be a valid catch because uh, fielder caught it in a hand that's not wearing a glove. If the fielder caught it with the other hand that's wearing a glove, that would be not out because that would be deemed illegal fielding. Over, Tom. Awesome. Thanks, Dula. Another question from Patience. Which one of the umpires is eligible to make the call of no ball where the keeper's glove is in front of the striker's wicket before the striker has had an opportunity to play the ball or has made contact with the ball, bat or person? And I see my mate Sipelele Gasa, a Cricket South Africa elite panel umpire, answered Patience's question. It is the strikers and umpire who makes that call. So thanks, Mr. Gasa, sir, for your contribution. And Patience, thanks for the questions. Next question from Lungisani. Langton has already answered, uh, but Langton's hand is up, so I'm sure he wants to contribute to one of these questions in the chat box. Please go ahead, Langton. No, I, I don't want to contribute. I want to ask. I am I'm a little lost-ish. Mm. Right. And and I thought it was an interesting scenario that patients asked because the law says only the wicked keepers are allowed to wear gloves. And if they're not the only one wearing gloves, is there a penalty for that? Yeah, that so would be I, my question. Um, good, good question. And, and I think we have seen in the past where a wicked keeper discards his or her gloves and one of the fielders, just because they have had a boring day at first slip without any catches coming their way, uh, decides to put one or both of the wicket keeper's gloves on. I have never seen a fielder penalized for putting a wicket keeper's gloves on unless and until a throw comes in and they actually come in contact with the ball um, with the keeper's gloves that are on. I can't think of anything in law that 
says a player will be penalized merely for putting the gloves on. Um, my understanding is that the ball must come into contact with the gloves worn by the fielder who is not a wicketkeeper for penalty runs to apply. Abdullah, your opinion, please. Well, th that is my interpretation as well. It must come into contact uh, with the glove. If it doesn't come into contact with the glove, um, it will not be deemed illegal fielding. I uh, will whisper in the fielder's ear uh, that mm. you're lucky the ball didn't come into contact with the glove. Please, next time, uh, do not pick up the gloves. It's only for keepers uh, to wear the gloves and keeper, keepers can use it to field the ball. No other field is allowed to pick up or use the gloves to field the ball. Over, Tom. And, and that, that, that would also be what I would do. And I thought it was an interesting question that patients asked. And I, I thought from a field, field craft perspective, I would do exactly what you said, Abdullah. And I thought once we go looking for stuff, it might make it very hard for us to go through a game. Mm. But I, I like that you then told, well, clarified for people that if it then doesn't touch that hand, you wouldn't do anything about it except educate the players about it. Because that's what I would do as well, because there's nothing in the laws about that. So that's exactly what I would do. Awesome. Right. Um, Pratish. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Tom. Yeah, yeah carry on. No, no, sorry, Langton asked that question. Uh, we also see nowadays um, fielders while practicing, they're wearing catching gloves or some kind of uh, thing which they're wearing. Are they allowed to wear during the field when they're on the field? In my opinion, no. I just wanted to. Good question, question, Pratish. Uh, Langton, you want to take us through uh, the protocols and permissions for fielders? Um, I know they're not allowed to wear gloves, but what about when their hands are injured? What about uh, tape and um, strapping on their hands? Is, uh, that is, that is, yeah. is gloves so permitted? Is, is, is strapping permitted? Uh, in Australia? South Africa playing India. And the bowler then, Hanik Pandya, was wearing, because he had bruised uh, fingers, he was wearing something that looked like a glove. It wasn't glove, it was taping, but it was so thick that if he caught the ball, it would have been the same as wearing a glove. And the mesh wave passed on a message to me to pass on to him to take it off or make it a, a lot smaller than what it was. And he took it off. So you shouldn't be wearing anything that might give you an advantage on field. And it's it's expected of umpires to check taping all of that because one, it might be abrasive and it might be used to change the condition of the ball. And two, it might be giving a field an advantage when catching the ball. So we need to be checking taping on field. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Langton. Perfect. Thanks, Langton. For answering that question. Good question, Pratish. Uh, last question in the chat box comes from uh, Lungisani Ngube. If a player comes onto the field of play in contravention of 24.2.2 and comes into the contact, comes into contact with the ball while it is in play, the ball shall immediately become dead. The umpire shall award five penalty runs to the batting side. Um, Lungisani uh, doesn't agree with your interpretation, Abdullah. Um, Abdullah, you said that uh, even if a um, substitute player comes onto the field and without permission comes into contact with the ball, then we will uh, punish that player. Um, Lungisani, I just want to read from the law book. 24.4, if a player comes onto the field of play in contravention of 24.2.2, that means he comes on without permission and comes into contact with the ball while it is in play, then the ball shall immediately, be, immediately become dead and 
we shall award five penalty runs. So um, what I want to highlight here is even though the heading says player returning without permission, the text below it uh, doesn't specify that this player is returning. It says if a player comes onto the field of play. OK, so that can be a substitute player coming onto the field for the first time, or it can be a player returning to the field. Langton, you want to add to that? Please go ahead. Without realizing it, uh, Lungisani is agreeing with Abdullah because <laughs> for a person who's leaving the field to have someone replacing them, the umpire needs to give consent for that person to leave the field. Otherwise, there wouldn't be need for the other person to be on the field of play. So if that person comes off the field of play and this person comes on, it means the umpires didn't know that this person left the field, which also means they didn't know that this person came onto the field and they're treated as though they are returning without permission. So he's agreeing with, with Abdullah without realizing that he is. Perfect. Uh, uh, just just to add to that, um, uh, Tom, and where I got my uh, interpretation from, I got it from the ICC Almanac, mm -hmm. where the ICC Almanac actually covers exactly the scenario where it states uh, if an unauthorized person comes onto the field of play, a legitimate substitute, like in the example that you uh, we use, the I ICC uh, stipulates that you treat it exactly as a player returning without permission where you go through the steps, five penalty runs, four not to count as one for the over, et cetera, et cetera. So there, are, that's where I got my interpretation from, from the guidance, from the ICC via the Almanac. Perfect. Thanks, Tula, for clarifying that. Uh, Lungisani uh, is back on the chat box. He says, if the ball doesn't come into contact with the gloves, so I'm assuming this is a fielder who has collected the discarded wicketkeeper's gloves. If the ball doesn't come into contact with the gloves and possibly the fielder lets the ball go through his hands on purpose, does this constitute mock fielding? Abdullah, this is a very dodgy fielder, uh, trying many different things. Um, do you want to just touch on uh, mock fielding and how we apply uh, the penalties to that? It is in Law 41, which is not covered in the Level 1 exam, but um, we will address um, Lungisani's question in closing the lecture tonight. Uh, Lugisani, uh, when it comes to um, uh, mock field fielding, and that particular section uh, falls under Law 41.